Hi everyone, this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and uh, we are actually waiting for David Adair. I, I know that we are scheduled for tonight, so um, my partner is calling him and trying to reach him on his uh, regular phone. I don't know if something happened, I don't know what's going on, but um, just thought I'd come online and, and just uh, tell you. and. Uh, I, I guess I can talk about some of the things going on with Camelot in the meanwhile uh, while we're waiting for David and hopefully he will show up. <laughs> so uh, basically just want to say that I have uh, almost finished editing uh, the John Lear and it's it's going to be fascinating for people and then uh, as everyone knows I've also been working on the Mark Richards interview and uh, I'm going to be recording that transcript so to speak that I've, I've put together and uh, that's quite a, an involved um, task to you know do my total recall to get it all down on paper and and then to actually present it to you so you have both a video uh, transcript and an op and a, a written one so that's what's going on with that um, let's see what else can I tell you uh, I am trying to get Jack Sarfati on the show. He's a very interesting physicist. And uh, so we're waiting to find out if, if that can be scheduled sometime soon. I know he go goes between England and America because he has a, an English partner, I believe. So um, I, I don't know if we are having any luck getting David. What's going on? No, he didn't answer his phone. Computer virus. Can't do it. He can't do it? No. You're kidding. Oh, no. He, he just yeah. told you that? Yeah. Is he on the phone? If the phone works, he'll do it over the phone. Oh, well, then let's do that. No problem. That's absolutely no problem. If the phone will stay. I Hello? I'm cool. Oh. I don't know if this phone will stay online. I'm going live right now, so... I, uh, hello? I'm losing my, I'm losing the connection. My phone's not going to connect. It's just unbelievable. Where my apartment is, is not a good location for phone calls. Um, but I can call him using my Skype. So if everyone will stand by, that's what I'll do. Cause this phone is obviously not going to work for me. Um, there's some kind of interference where I live for, my cell phone. Right. Uh, so bear with me, and uh, and and I'll um, I'll mute myself. Come to find out, it was done by um, the people that put up the firewalls for me. Oh, really? Something that, yeah, something y'all should be aware of. There's a company called Avast. Okay. And they uh, have a new owner. And what the uh, what they're doing is uh, they called me up and asked me if 
said, your computer's infected with a virus. Um, we can fix it for you. And I went, really? How? And it was. And I said, how do you know I have a virus? And it's what it is. They injected the virus through the tunnel they established through their software so they can make more money. And I called Better Business Bureau and they got thousands of complaints. So oh, wow. Watch out for that particular group. It's not the original owner. It's called a bass. Um, a B A S T. Okay. And I used, I used to have them for years, but now they're tunneling into your computer and introducing Trojan horses. Okay. Very, nice. very, very strange. Uh, well, I mean, money. I mean, to make more money that way. So I'm glad to have you here anyway on the show. Um, I, you know, we have an audience and they've been standing by waiting for you. So, um, I'm sorry that there was a mix up uh, also, I guess, regarding time or something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, we're good. On my calendar here, 10 p.m. Now I'm Eastern Standard Time is, is in your, what time zone are you in? Uh, California, so yeah. And, so isn't it 10 p.m.? It is, it's um, <laughs> okay. uh, 10 after 10 here. All right, good enough. Uh, we're just starting here, so that would be the right time. All right. Well, we're we're good. Um, okay. Uh, you know, you asked me, or you made a comment about something. I was telling you about. Um, uh, I believe it was you who was talking about the moon, and uh, we left packages up there of instruments. And okay. I believe you said, "Why couldn't we do that remotely?" Was that you? No, that wasn't me. But it's okay. You can answer that question anyway. Well, it's a great, it was a great question. Um, people, uh, you know, question whether we went to the moon or not. And um, I've heard this so many times, and I, I just had to go back over some historical stuff I have that I'm sure very few people of today are aware of uh, with the uh, lunar uh, Apollo landing. Um, I was there firsthand with all this stuff. Uh, I was a teenager, but. Um, I got to see a lot of this stuff, and just the size of the program was amazing. You know, if we're going to fake something, why in God's name did we build all that we built down there um, at um, Kennedy Space Center? Uh, I had forgotten about some of the size and volumes and stuff. The vehicle assembly building where we would uh, assemble the Apollo moon rocket in, that thing is so big uh, in volume. You could take five United Nations buildings, roll them up, put them inside that building, and be 100 feet away from the walls. That's how much volume it is. You just can't imagine the size of everything that we dealt with down there, how big it was. Um, the building itself was so big that there was an eight-acre roof. That's, that's huge. Um, it was so tall at 512 feet that if we didn't have special air conditioning system clouds would form in the top of the building and rain inside <laughs> right that's awesome you know it's just amazing and then um, then you get into the size of the vehicles and the weights and everything uh, you know people are interested in me kind of you know, seem to know a little bit about rockets well let me tell you something about these rocket engines the Saturn F1 engine um, they're fuel pumps. I stood there and watched them work. Now, you wouldn't think fuel pumps would be very interesting. Well, these fuel pumps are moving kerosene and liquid oxygen at a rate of 5,000 gallons per second. Now, a gallon weighs nine pounds. That's 45,000 pounds of fuel you're sucking in per second. And to give you an idea, they would burn for two minutes on the first stage. In those two minutes, we would consume 54 railroad tank cars of fuel. Can you imagine that? That's incredible, yeah. And we're burning up over 2,100 tons of propellant. Um, people just can't get your head around something so vast. And these things did all that. I stood right there and watched them uh, check out in test stands and then in Alabama and then went to the Cape and it launched. and. Um, and it's just really amazing to think people we didn't do any of this stuff and i stood right there and watched all this stuff being built uh, the transporter that you saw transporting the um 
the space shuttle. Well, it was originally built to transport the Saturn V. When the Saturn V was fully loaded, it weighed six million pounds. And it sat on top of the transporter and with the umbilical tower, the weight of the tower and the rocket and the transporter, that's a 12 million pound load that you're moving at a rate of one mile per hour for three miles uh, down to the causeway to the pad. And just to give you an idea of the tracks on the transporter, uh, the nut and bolt to hold the track on, the bolt weighs 150 pounds and the nuts weigh 75 pounds. <laughs> And this whole thing was designed by a woman. Oh, right. So a lot of stuff in history that you just pass over and don't think about. And so the thought that we would face something like that, I mean, look at the size and the weight of stuff we had to build. And then um, then comes uh, a, a SLEP. You know what a SLEP is? Um, no. That's the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. There was one left at each landing site. Now, inside that uh, slip, uh, you had a lunar seismic experiment. You had a triaxis magnetometer. Uh, that is where we would measure the moon's internal magnetic field and the solar wind. We had a solar wind experiment. Uh, we had an ion detector. And we had a, a lunar heat flow measurement. That was really interesting. Uh, the instrument measures the outflow of heat from the moon's interior. Um, we have a low energy solar wind experiment, and we had a lunar active lunar seismic experiment. Well, Which, David, um, yeah. I just want to ask you though, because you know I have this witness, William Tompkins, who claims he was actually in a sort of an underground location in California, listening live to them, you know, landing on the moon and the whole thing. And okay. he heard over the audio, this has been reported, I don't know if you've heard it, you know, that um, I guess it was Neil Armstrong exclaiming over the, uh, the craft that were already there looking at them. And I have a picture or he drew a picture. It's on the internet. Um, you can see the rim with the craft and he said the reptilians were actually standing outside their craft waiting for them, you know, the astronauts to land. And um, so I'm just wondering if you heard that uh, story and um, William Tompkins, who's an, uh, you know, a disclosure witness out there that I interviewed is talking about this. So have you ever heard that? Uh, I've heard of it. Yeah. And, um, it's, well, maybe you would like to hear this then. All right. I always try to avoid this in conversation because it just becomes awkward, but this would be a good time to bring it up. I always take the question at dinner uh, when some, they start going around the room and asking, where were you when Neil walked on the moon? And almost everybody's called flashbulb memory. Uh, you know where you were when you saw those first images of them walking on the moon. Well, they get to me and I have a choice, either A, lie, or B, tell the truth. Now, lie would be, um, I was sitting at home watching it on TV. Uh, the truth is a little bit more stranger. The truth is, when Neil was walking on the moon, I was leaning back on the knees of Viola Armstrong, that's Neil's mother. I'm sitting, leaning against her, in Wapakoneta, Ohio, at their home with their uh, Neil's dad, uh, Stephen uh, Armstrong, all the original seven Mercury astronauts on the floor in front of me, and they're watching it. And we were just barraged by an ocean of reporters and such. Um, Viola Armstrong and I, we were really, really close. She was like my surrogate mother. And when Neil was sleeping on the moon that night, I was sleeping in Neil's childhood bed. Right. And you can imagine. I that mean, you know, actually, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we did go over that in my last interview with you. Now, this oh. interview, and I, you know, I love that story, so it's no no worries about telling it again. But what I, I want to... asked Neil about that incident, and um, Neil was just, he always had this really nice smile. He just smiled at me, and he said, um... He said, there's a lot of stories that you're going to be hearing in the future about a lot of this stuff. And he goes, um, a 
lot of it is classified, and I'll just keep you out of it, David. I just won't tell you. So something, if I've known him long enough, that's the point I bring all of that up. I've knew these people. Um, you know, I knew Neil, and I could tell something was up, but he's holding something back. What it was, I have no idea. But um, do you know, this is some pertinent information. Do you know why he was picked to be the first man on the moon instead of Buzz Aldrin? This is interesting. Did you know Neil's mental profile showed that he was a hermit in nature? When he came back from the moon, where did he go? He just kind of dropped out of uh, after a few, uh, you know, made his rounds and tours and stuff. After that, he just kind of dropped out of out of uh, public view. Uh, that is in his nature to do so, and they didn't want the one human being carrying the largest title around of the century. That is first man on the moon. So they knew that he would just kind of recluse away, and he did, and he became a professor in Lebanon, Ohio, at the University of Cincinnati. And that's where he stayed for a long time, but he would occasionally go out uh, to South Dakota and uh, work with his brother who had oil well rigs and uh, the, some of the other things he did. But he was pretty much out of the public view of things, and that's what NASA wanted. They did not want him seeking publicity, and he really didn't. He just kind of disappeared, if y'all noticed that. Now, Buzz Aldrin was just the opposite. He really was going after it, but that's why he ends up the second man on the moon. He wouldn't carry that title. And when, and when Neil died, do you remember what they did with his body? No. He, uh, he had him cremate the ashes, and they were scattered and went and at sea. And um, so he didn't even want a memorial to him. So there's really no grave site that you can go to to see the first man on the moon. And that was in his nature to be that way, and that's exactly what NASA wanted. Oh, well, that's uh, very they, interesting. Uh, you know, what I wanted, you know, I just want to say, David, that remember you just went and presented your stuff over at the UFO uh, con that was here in California, right? Correct. Right. And so last time I had you on my show, a lot of our conversation had to sort of skirt around the real story of what happened to you. And so tonight I want you to tell that story all about, you know, from the beginning, because you have a great, you're, you really are great in terms of telling the story because you remember all the details. So yeah. can you talk about how you were, I guess, you, br you built this rocket and then you were, I don't know, you say taken against your will is, is how you, I've, I've heard you word it. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. So uh, can you talk about that and go all the way to where you climb on the craft and the whole no, nine yards? I can do that. Thank you. Now people ask, uh, well, how can he do that? You know, it must be a natural security as well. That's where strong Thurman said to me once I was the worst loose cannon on the deck. Uh, what he meant by that was that at the time all this was occurring, I was, uh, 15, 16 and 17 years old. You cannot sign, a minor under a national security oath. It's against the Constitution. So I can tell you what happened. It's just that simple. Now, after high school graduation, um, I was taken uh, to the military, and that was a second kidnapping, actually. And the first time I was abducted, um, I went to Area 51 for one day, about a 12, 14 hour day. And um, Never worked there like uh, other people have claimed. I just there one day, so you know people are just puzzled. Why I didn't? Why are you not a UFO researcher? Why didn't you after this? Now, it was one day out of my life. Like I'm going to spend my whole life and build it around one day event. I don't think so. I uh, had a whole life going for me uh, in corporate America, which is where I went uh, with science, but. In that one day, we did do a lot, and it's how I got there is, is the story. Um, see, people think uh, that I was building a, um, a fusion containment uh, rocket engine. Actually, that's technically correct, but overall, fundamentally, that's not correct. That's not what I was doing. 
I'm working on a power plant. I'm looking for an electromagnetic fusion containment nuclear power plant. That's what I'm building. Uh, but the only way to test the fields that could have to hold the force of a nuclear chain reaction, the electromagnetic uh, field, uh, the only thing I could really come up with on a way to test the fields, I need a medium to test it in. So the only thing I could come up with is a rocket engine. If you build an electromagnetic fusion containment rocket engine, you still have to have the same containment field that you'd have in a nuclear power plant. And the easiest thing available to me at the time was just that, a rocket engine. And I had been working on rockets for quite a few years before I even started that part of the process. Um, so let's back up. <laughs> it's it's uh, the story. If I bounce around, I end up sounding like Pulp Fiction, um, <laughs> where you're out of the timeline and you <laughs> wish you could just re-edit it and put everything in chronological order. Um, well, one person did that. That was uh, Art Bell in 1997. And it took Art from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. It took him seven hours to get my story out. And he rearranged his program while it was going on. And he said, I'm canceling everything else. I'm just staying with this story. And uh, the thing that Art noticed that it flowed in a chronological order. And events that happened layered upon each other, causing the next set of events to happen. And they're all connected. And, um, and Art was very cool about it. And uh, he's, there were critics coming online. And uh, Art had a simple reply to him. He said, I want to tell you all something. If somebody's going to lie like this, they wouldn't make a seven-hour lie with <laughs> us of characters that we can check on, hundreds of details that all connect the dots together. I mean, you would do something that's very simple so when you repeat it, you don't make an error. He said, nobody can make up something like this. And, and he's quite right. I, I was doing this recall. So the story that Art Bell got on 1997, that's what happened. And let's see where we start. We're not going to get it all done, but I can highlight a lot of it along the way. Um, and a lot of people have a tendency to want to jump straight into it. They already 51. And I went, yeah, I can understand that, you know, for the sake of time. But the problem is your credibility gets stretched out to the limit because you've got to verify how it is that what happened that got you there. <clears throat> you can't just say, oh, yeah, man, I love listening to Montrevani music as I was flying to Venus on a UFO. You know, that, that just doesn't make sense. Um, now, if you had an existing story with all of the details that led up to that point, then you got something. But um, so with me, it started. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did one lecture one time. And I started off and I was in an uh, all black church. There was a, in Atlanta that I was invited there by a really, really good friend of mine named um, Carl McNair. His brother was Ron McNair, the black astronaut to die on Challenger. Wow. But uh, I had to address this audience and I started out. <laughs> I was born a poor black child. <laughs> And uh, finally, somebody, the soprano singer behind me, she got it and busted out laughing, and everybody else laughed. And uh, I was quoting from the movie The Jerk, Steve Martin. But <laughs> the thing is, I was born very poor. I was born to a, a coal miner. I was born in number 10 Pocahontas coal fields in Welch, West Virginia. Now, three miles from where I was born is a place called Coalwood. West Virginia, and there was a guy born there. His name was Homer Hickman, and they did a movie about him. He built rockets too, and they called it October Sky. Oh right, uh, okay, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Homer and I often laughed about that when it came to us, and we said we both were born three miles from each other. Look at that in our lives, and we both come to the conclusion it must have been something in the water. <laughs> right. But anyway. Um, Homer was actually 12 years older than me, and uh, and he couldn't play football for squat, so he got his scholarship out of there. I went a different route. Um, but where I really started everything was in the, the library in Welch, West Virginia. Um, I'm seven years old, and I'm over in the corner uh, where all the um, 
science books are. And the um, pretty elderly um, librarian, uh, she saw me over there. And she came over and she goes, I see you sitting here for hours every day. You're reading these books. I said, yeah, uh, there's no pictures in them. <laughs> so I got to be reading them. And she said, really? So she picks up one of these books and just off the shelf at random. And she said, okay, this book here is a quantum theory on a singularity. Tell me what that is. And she's looking at the book and I said, oh, singularity. Uh, it's also known as a black hole. It's what happens when you have a star that's moving through a, a, con a collapse and um, it will move into a neutron star and they'll go beyond that you know, condense itself down until uh, it becomes um, a singularity, which is about the most powerful thing there ever is. And uh, they call it a black hole because it sucks up uh, even light. X-rays can't escape it, not even light. So wherever one of these flat stars moves through space, you suddenly lose all the starlight from the other stars as it passes between you and the other stars. So it's a black hole in space, and that's how it got its name. She goes, you really do read this stuff? I said, yeah, <laughs> I She goes, well, how many of these books have you read? And I said, there was probably about four or 500 of them, I guess. I said, all of them? And she goes, you've read all of these books. Why are you reading them now? I'm going through, I'm correcting the mistakes. <laughs> and <laughs> she kind of had a seat on that one. And, um, she said, would you like to get other books in this area? I said, yeah, but look where we're at. We are in the middle of a Pocahontas coal field. I don't think I'm going to find them. She said, well, if you don't tell anyone, because I'll get in trouble with use of resources, I'll order any book you want. So I wrote out this grocery list, and by golly, she ordered them all. <laughs> and I got to read hundreds of books because of her. And that really helped because I was able to start compiling my own thoughts and everything. And, um, and you got to remember, this is uh, this is back there. This is um, uh, 1961. So uh, in 1961, I was consuming everything there was in those areas, and it really did help quite a bit. And there's no such thing as internet or faxes or pages and modems or any of that stuff. Nothing that, like that existed. And... Um, uh, our internet would be an encyclopedia set. <laughs> so I just had to hard read uh, stuff to gather up what I could, but it was enough to where it allowed me to start, uh, start my own rocketry research. And everybody thought I was just building rockets for competition or um, to learn about them, uh, such as a good job that uh, Homer did with himself with them. Um, I was a little bit beyond that. I, I wasn't building them to learn from them. I was building them to work out theorems and see if my theorems are correct on the hypothesis that I had of theories that applied to fusion containment. Now, I'm only seven years old at this time. So uh, I was really um, lectured to by the librarian not to tell anybody what I'm doing and what I'm reading. I don't think she wanted any feedback and, uh, uh, for ordering all the books. But I, uh, it was why she said, don't tell anybody what you're thinking and working on. It's going to make it more difficult for you. And um, I think she was mean on a sociologically area, but she was right. Uh, nobody's going to understand it anyhow. I think I'm a, a little freaky kid, which I was. So, uh, But I was good in sports. That's what made it different, and I was able to blend in well. I could play really good baseball. I could hit the ball like crazy. Um, but anyway, um, I, once I got enough there, uh, then a uh, chain of events start occurring. That just starts correcting everything. And it's just really amazing stuff. Um, well, uh, you know, I want to stop you right there, David. Uh, I want to ask you if, uh, you know, because later on, you have told me this story off offline. And it was fascinating to listen to, and I, I want you to continue. But I, I want to know right now, if you look back when you were a kid, 
did you feel you were in contact with something uh, unseen or being guided uh, when you say a, a series of events happened? Uh, was because the, later on you sort of intimated to me, it seemed that maybe that the craft or the beings that built the craft might have been in touch with you. So, and that you even might be in touch with them now. So, would you look back on your life and say that there was something guiding you there? Um, excellent question. Um, there was something going on that I knew that we just could not pigeonhole it. We cannot put it in a box. We can't put a name or label on it. Um, it wouldn't fit logically within our reasons of deduction and conclusions. And uh, it, yeah, it's something beyond our understanding. Um, yeah, I've always felt that something was out there pulling strings. And did you think you were unusual? Because, you know, it, it appears librarian thought you were unusual. Were you at that young age? And I don't know how old you were exactly at that age, but um, maybe you can tell us. But, uh, you know, were you aware that you were unusually intelligent? Oh, yeah. It, even earlier. Uh, my mother even told me so. Uh, I was two years old. Actually, I was one and a half, and um, just learned to walk. I was walking, and um, and a toy of mine got away from me, and it got in between the wall and the refrigerator. So I was standing there looking at it, and my mother's watching me. She didn't do anything. So I'm looking at her, and, and I guess she wasn't going to do anything. So I, was, I got to figure something out here. So I'm looking around the kitchen. I go over and grab this broom. And I reach in back to the back of the refrigerator and I pull the toy out. And then I pick up the toy and take off. <laughs> and my mother stand there and she, and she tells my dad, he's not even a year and a half old. He's already deducted out what tool he needed, went and got his toy and took off. <laughs> and she said, uh, my dad's name was Fred. He goes, Fred, there's something not right about that child. We're gonna keep <laughs> that's and that, that, that's one of the first things I was told that I started looking not quite not quite a normal kid and uh, and just more things after that just went on um, but yeah uh, I always knew that there was something a little bit different about me I just looked at things differently I I felt um, old at times and um, I just seemed to you know, even when I play with other kids, like they're going to do something to get in trouble, I can see it coming and I'll tell them we don't want to do that. You know, adults are going to get mad at us. And they thought I was just uh, stuffy or, you know, not wanting to do wild things. And I said, no, I just understood. Uh, I guess I just had a more mature attitude on things. So uh, I told them, you really don't want to do that. You're going to get in trouble. But that's coming from a guy that, not allowed to play with mashes and my first rocket took off and incinerated the yard the size of a football field and my rocket left at about probably reached top speed about 12,000 miles an hour and went about 51,000 feet up a little bit more than 10 miles how old and were and how old were you then let's see that was the first serious liquid fuel called a cryogenic engine that I built and let's see I was uh, 11 years old Okay. So by and, uh, so by the time you built the rocket that for Area Fifty One or got you into Area Fifty One, you were seventeen. Is that right? Yeah, I started the designs on that particular uh, engine design. I started when I was twelve, <laughs> and um, uh, by the time I was fifteen, more events happened and more players get involved and. I was able to start construction, and 26 and a half months later, we end up with uh, Piflin. And that's the name of the fusion rocket that I built. And uh, the word Piflin came from my mother, who had a dream, a really cool dream. And uh, she saw the name on the side of the rocket, and it said Piflin, P-I-T-H-O-L-E-M. Oh. And it's a word that you cannot find in any known language base anywhere on the planet. Really? So, yeah, it's an original word. Fascinating. And, uh, yeah, all right. Came from a dream, my mother's dream. So, so that's what I named it. I named it Pistol. And um, Pistol was just, uh, God, it was, it was extraordinary.
extraordinary uh, in the design and power. And it really wasn't what I was really planning on building. It was just, to me, it was like I, I built this hammer, which I called Pistol. And I'm going to use it to build something else much bigger, uh, which would be the fusion power plant. So, um, and that's when the, the you know, it, a ton of things that happened up to this point. Um, and, you know, critics I get, uh, they criticize crap and um, they haven't got a clue what they're criticizing because they don't even know the story. And uh, people like Stanton Freeman, because I've investigated, oh, really? Well, we just spent <laughs> 10 years putting my documentary together and all the people we have in the film, which is all the people that, uh, a lot, some of them are direct eyewitnesses and all the stuff we did. And I asked them if they heard the name Stanton Freeman, never heard of him. <laughs> investigated things, why haven't these sources heard from him? Because he never investigates. He does what he uh, blames other people doing that he does. He calls it uh, investigation by proclamation. Okay, so well, just, I just heard, uh, I was just listening to a Bill Cooper interview, and Bill Cooper said that Stanton Freeman was, you know, recruited by Majestic, back in the day to be part of a disinfo uh, campaign to take people was, off track about... Well, I worked as a disinformation agent, but he's a nuclear... Yeah, he's got a degree in nuclear physics, and um, but he has never worked a single day in the lab in his life. He's never built anything. Uh, kind of odd, isn't it? So anyway, with me, I can show you my work. It's, it's out here in my lab. Um, I've been doing this stuff God, since I was a child. Um, I, yeah, have, I have no doubt in my mind. I have no doubt in my mind about you. But why don't you um, tell us, so there was a number of things that happened that led up to you building your actual final rocket. Did you have help uh, with that rocket? Oh, my God, yeah. Um, there's no way I could have, you know, some of the criticism from uh, Freeman, he's absolutely right. If no, <laughs> I couldn't build something like that, you know, in a whale shop at the local corner. Um, he's absolutely right. Uh, there was just this, that's where Art Bell picked up on. He said, my God, the name of pe all the people that's involved. I said, well, yeah, it, it first started out, <laughs> of all things, my mother. Uh, she was an LPN, that's a licensed practical nurse. And this was back in 1964. And something happened in mount vernon ohio that's really significant they built one of the first in the state a uh a cardio intensive care unit now today that's common as dirt but back in 1964 man this is cutting edge stuff and um and for us to get a a, a coronary care unit like that was a really big item and my mother uh started off as a as a, as a candy striper, the volunteer in a hospital, she worked up to uh, a nurse's aide. Then she went on to college and became an LPN. So they put her in charge of that coronary care unit at the graveyard shift from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. She loved that shift. And um, she's in charge of it. Well, why? what does this have to do with your story? A lot. <laughs> uh, what it, it set up the next set of dots that's all going to connect. She's sitting there every night and she has a patient there. And um, and his name is Irvin. And Irvin is about 93. And his wife, Arizona, is there. She's about 91. And Irvin is just mean as a snake. And uh, he knocked out one of her nurses, one of the mother's nurses with a cane. She grabbed a cane and went back in there and broke the cane right next to the bed rail next to him he said you get one of my girls again i will beat you to death and so he uh <laughs> behaved after that wow. well why is that important well irving and arizona have a son named curtis and their last name is lamay these are the parents of four-star general curtis lamay chief of the joint chiefs right all right enough power for you no, there's more. He's also the founder of SAC, Strategic Air Command. He's the designer of the B-52 Stratos Fortress. 
He is also the man sitting with the nuclear switches under his fingers for President Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, I, got, so, I know something about him that I don't know if you know uh, that Mark Richards says. Mark Richards says that Curtis LeMay is the one who's responsible for us having a base on the moon when they, the aliens, didn't want us to. He said Curtis LeMay wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I, I don't know anything about that part of the story, <laughs> but I, that sounds like Curtis. Curtis, uh, oh my God, Curtis was a, such a force to be reckoned with. Um, he was a force of nature. Uh, he was standing on the flight lines at Wright Parents Air Force Base and the B-52s are being refueled and they're standing fuel all over the place. And he's standing there lighting up his stogie. So this lieutenant approached him and said, General, I don't think you should be smoking a cigar in the middle of the fuel loading of the bombers might blow up. And he turned around and looked at the bombers and he looked back at the lieutenant and said, they wouldn't dare. <laughs> and that's <laughs> LeMay. Oh, right. Uh, just a he's just a, just a powerful individual. But um, see, when I met up with him, it was 1960. Well, my mother met him uh, earlier, back in 1966. And uh, he would ask my mother, um, you know, you get to know somebody. He has to go through my mother to see his parents. She's in charge of the uh, CCU. Right. Unit. So her and LeMay became friends. Her and Curtis became good friends. And he asked her about her family. And she said, I have three sons. Uh, two of them are just normal. But the third one is definitely odd. And he goes, how is he odd? Goes, That's all this rocket stuff. Well, that called, you know, Curtis. What well, kind of rocket stuff? And she started describing things. And he goes, are you serious? So he, now this is how far Curtis is. He goes, Does he write anything down? Does he have a journal or notebook? And he goes, yeah, he's got this one book he keeps under his arm all the time. He even sleeps with it. Um, he, he, that he said that it's all the masses that he needs to complete a fusion containment field. <laughs> way, Curtis said, you couldn't bring that by one day, could you? So I go to bed at 11 at night. I'm already asleep when she goes to work. So she took my notebook I didn't know about. She went to the hospital. There's Curtis. She sh showed, hands it to him. He looks through it. Is 93 pages of it, and he is not totally lost in it. He understands some of it. So he just looked at my mother and asked real coyly, uh, do you have a copier? <laughs> <laughs> so he copies, thank goodness, not all of it, but he copied oh, about wow. a third of it uh, from the beginning. And then he took it uh, to the next place uh, in Columbus, Ohio, a place called Battelle Memorial. You ever heard of it? But Town Memorial is one of the largest think tanks in the world. Mm. Uh, in 1964, they had 137 Nobel laureates there in science and physics. So it's a very powerful place. So he took my mass there, and they looked at it, and they asked, he asked, is this just a bunch of chicken scratch or giblets or is there something to it? And they said, no, it's somebody working on a, on a quantum uh, level trying to achieve fusion containment and, and so it's something to it he goes yeah it's something to it. we haven't seen anything like this and uh, so they sent it off to another place uh and they passed it around and and then uh, some more individuals show, showed up the point is by the time lemay got to me um see that let me bring up the current events it's 1968 at this time and general lemay is running for Vice President of the United States with his running mate, George Wallace. Do you uh, remember that? Oh, no, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's where you got Hoover and uh, all the other people, candidate, Democrat candidates. But anyway, um, he lost a race. And that was in, 19, in November 1968. Come January 6, 1969, I get a knock on my front door. And I, I answered the door and opened up, and there's this full bird colonel in the Air Force. He goes, hi, are you David Adair? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, my name is Colonel um, Arthur Bailey Williams, I'm Colonel Williams, <laughs> and I'm XO for General LeMay. 
and I'm here to offer you a proposal. And I said, yeah, come on in. <laughs> and the proposal is that he said, we've looked over some of your preliminary work, but we'd like to fund you with everything and everybody and all the stuff you're going to need to finish your fusion containment rocket. And I went, really? Now, what do you think I'm going to say? No. <laughs> and um, now this is, it's Pulp Fiction going to happen here. We'll jump way forward about 45 years. Um, I'm in North Carolina, and over the mountain from me is Tennessee. There's a town there named Maryville, Tennessee. Hmm. Now, Maryville, Tennessee, there's somebody that has something to do with the story. There is a probate judge there. And if you call the probate judge, Maryville, Tennessee, and ask who the executor was of Jan Williams, the only daughter of Colonel Williams, who was the executor of the Williams estate? David Tyson Adair. Right. So how do you Photoshop that? <laughs> so anyway, now That's back good. to the story. <laughs> That's a great Williams line. Is, That's a great line. Okay, go ahead. So Williams is there and he goes, well, David, uh, my background is, uh, is also nuclear physics. And I went, oh, really? I said, that's helpful. He said, let's write up a grocery list. And I went, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So I do. I'll write up my list of what we're going to need. And as we're going through that list, there's other things coming up. We're going to need all kinds of shops. We're going to need all kinds of skilled personnel. And LeMay is directing uh, Colonel Williams and saying, so he said, we're going to modularize this entire operation. So we send different parts off to different labs. People that were involved, um, the Tell Memorial, um, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. All right. National uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Okay. Um, oh my God, it just the list goes on and on. And there were dozens of uh, Yeah, it, I, I'm actually looking at, at Battelle, uh, and the information here, at least on Wikipedia, if it's correct, says they were managing Brookhaven National Labs, which is a pretty key place as well. Well, there's something else. Do you know who manages Area 51? Battelle Memorial, and that's classified. <laughs> Oh wow. wow! Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, they, you know, that they would be. I mean, they they have their hand in everything. It says uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, I I can yep. tell you that um, Lawrence Livermore, uh, our Henry Deacon, uh, one of our witnesses. Uh, I think I'm at liberty to say he 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 worked there. Um, so yeah, big time. Yeah, very very interesting. So so in other words, he farmed this out. Uh, yeah. All these different agencies, all these different groups. Um, I would give specifics on machining certain items, um, but no one had an idea what their parts were doing. Some of them figured out it was propulsion. Others were trying to figure out something nuclear. Um, and then just their own curiosity, they were trying to figure out what to just go to, and they would get no answers. Just build it to the precise uh, to the spec that we provide you and then all the parts come back and then that's when i start assembly and that's another interesting situation um it, uh, we're skipping over parts that play very important roles in this story uh, my dad and his background it, it feeds directly into this you know because people ask well where'd you get all the equipment and the skills and know-how well, let me back up again. Here we go, Pulp Fiction. We'll go back to, um, let's see, I'm about, still remember, I wasn't even in school yet. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'm still in a stroller. But I remember my parents, um, my, if you saw the movie October Sky. I did, and I uh, love I love that movie. Okay, well, you know, Homer's dad was, was down there explaining situations to an old gentleman in a black suit, and they referred, he was the mine superintendent. And he was trying to explain to him why he needed time off to machine this thing for Homer. That superintendent is my mother's dad. He's my grandfather. That's how tight we are in the story. Right. Yeah. So my grandfather, my mother's dad, 
didn't want my dad working in the mines because his grandchildren might end up having no father. So he wanted to get my dad out of there. My dad was just extraordinarily gifted in a mechanic, but he never got past fifth grade because his parents pulled him out and uh, made him work in a coal mine to make money. So um, he got a garage. My grandfather got him a garage, and it was uh, it was really very successful in the first week. But these drivers would come in at three o'clock in the morning. I remember my parents nailing blankets over the windows of the garage because they didn't want their lights to be seen because these drivers are coming in with these really powerful cars, 392 Chrysler Hemi engines. And they have 200 gallon tanks in the trunk and it's not gasoline, it's moonshine. These are moon runners. <laughs> And they, dad, could tune their cars up till they were just like missiles. And it's very hard for the revenues to catch them on the roads. <laughs> and they didn't want to, they're looking for garages lit up at night to tune these powerful cars up. And if you didn't know this, half of the car, half of the drivers of NASCAR were moon runners. That's how NASCAR was born. That's, that, that's very cool. You know, this has got to be a movie. Tell me you had some luck with Hollywood and this is going to be a movie. Uh, I don't care that I've turned down offers. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to make a movie, I guess. We'll I, I'll make this movie. I, I can tell you this is an incredible movie. Okay, continue. Wait a minute, it gets way better. Um, so there's my dad tuning these cars up in the middle of the night. And uh, the customers are excellent because they all pay cash. And um, so dad had a heck of a business. Well, here's one day. This man comes in, his carburetor malfunctioned. It was a, a, a thing called a Spicer carburetor. With, they don't exist anymore. Very complicated, a lot of water jacket around it. Takes a whole day to change the thing out. So the guy knew a lot about automotive stuff and so he's telling my dad, man, it's gonna take a day to do this thing. But now I can get it done in about an hour and a half. And the man said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I can. He said, well, can I stand and watch? He said, sure. So about an hour and a half, exactly, Dad finishes it. And the man said, do you always work this fast? And he said, yeah, when I see what I'm doing, he didn't get the joke. Because <laughs> this is broad daylight. And um, <laughs> so anyway, the guy laughs and he says, look, I'm coming from Detroit. My car broke down here in West Virginia. I'm on my way to Florida. We're going to go to a town called Daytona, and we're going to race on the beach. I want to hire you as my mechanic. And Dad said, really? He said, yeah. And he goes, sticks out his hand. He goes, hi, my name is Lee Petty. <laughs> he has a son later named Richard Petty. You ever heard of him? I guess anyway, so. I'm not. Uh, yeah, okay. They're the most famous NASCAR drivers in history. All right. Uh, Very they're cool. the most prolific racing family that ever lived. Right. So my dad was, his, was Lee Petty's mechanic. So we moved to Daytona Beach out of West Virginia. I'm about two years old. And... Um, Later, uh, they built a Charlotte Motor Speedway, and we come to live in North Carolina, where I am now. And we moved to uh, Salisbury next to Randleman, and that's where the Petty Enterprises are. So what's this got to do with your story? Well, <laughs> hold on. It's all connected. Um, right. I let off back at that assembly shop, right? Well, we're leading up to that. Um, it turns out I'm really good at all mechanics. So the first engine I built for my dad was a 426 Chrysler Hemi engine with three deuces, that's three two-barrel carburetors. And it, on the dyno test, it was 975 horsepower I got out of that thing. And I did some different designs on the interior part. So it won the Grand National, that engine did. So my dad was really happy about it. I said, boy, wait till the world hears about my 12 year old son just built a Grand National engine. <laughs> and Lee, Patty, and Richard said, wait a minute, Fred, uh, we can't say anything about it for two reasons. One is they got this thing called child labor laws. And you're going to be happy about a 12 year old. And the other one is that man standing over there. His name is Bill France. He's chairman of NASCAR. He'll hang us all from the trees. <laughs> so, uh, I agreed, you know, they said, you understand, David? I said, yeah, no problem. I won't say a word to anybody. Well, Richard's looking at me, and he tells his uh, dad, he said, Dad, wait a minute. You can't just take that engine and leave David just standing here. I mean, that's not right. 
what do you want, David? Or anything you want? I said, <laughs> yeah, can I work in these shops at night? And they said, you got it. And they gave me the keys and the code to the place. And I said, if uh, you don't find anything you need, you just write it down and we'll order it. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but a NASA speed shop and a NASA rocket shop, they're mirrors of each other. Both shops are designed to produce speed, the ultimate speed. And we had drag racers in that building. So our fuels were um, liquid oxygen, uh, liquid hydrogen. So we had cryogenic fluids on hand and all special equipment that you need to handle it with. And then you know, we had nitro. Um, they also had exotic metals, titanium, aircraft aluminum, uh, all kinds of high stress, uh, lightweight materials. And we had all the, the vendor machines and the shears and the presses and just I mean, everything you would need. And so from that shop, I built my first rocket. And Excellent. it was a hygienic, uh, liquid fuel rocket engine. And um, um, that's how they would build something like that. I had a state-of-the-art NASCAR shop to work with. So you were doing that uh, before Curtis LeMay showed up at your door. Is that correct? That is correct. So I had all that built up all going right. on. My dad retired. He got injured. So he retired. But all that equipment of his came with it. So when we bought a house in Ohio, there was a house. And then on the far end of the property, what used to be a uh, dealership garage. Imagine how big those are. And all of dad's equipment was in there. And that's when I started building my rockets. I could really go to town. But then when LeMay showed up, it, everything went to steroids because he brought in a lot of Air Force personnel. And we reconstructed that entire garage into a state-of-the-art rocket assembly building. And yeah. Pitham was that big as far as rockets go, but I had everything I needed. And the first thing they did was they boarded up all the windows so you couldn't see in. They built this fake wall that um, covered the entrance port where we pull the rockets in and out. And the entire shop was hidden from view. And we had a, in the showroom, was my museum of all these models and rockets had up front. And it, nobody had a clue what the hell was going on behind that fake wall. So um, <laughs> that's how we did operations. And So, uh, now, okay, so, but when you started building this rocket, uh, this is your final rocket, is the one that actually ends up at, um, I forget, was it White Sands? Is that where it ended up? That's right. Okay, so. What so was. Um, how long did it take? I was just curious how long it took from the day he showed up at your door and then got things going to, for you to actually build this then? 26 and one half months. Oh, all right. Out. Yeah. Wow. And that's, that's a long time. That's two and a half years. And, um, and it was just amazing all the stuff that went Well, on. that and might be, that still might be. Uh, NASA and maybe Elon Musk. <laughs> I beat everything. I beat everybody on the planet. I didn't beat them just by a few months. I beat them by 45 years. Right. Because I achieved fusion containment. It didn't last very long. I was able to sustain 4.5 seconds of a field. Now that might not sound like much, but it's enough to work with a controlled detonation process. And just to speak up for myself, I guess, uh, NASA has spent $14 billion <laughs> and at 0. 0.007861.54 of one second. I'm at 4.5 seconds. That's an eternity. And so I got there in 1971, and they're still back at that percentage at 2017. I think I was ahead a little okay. bit. Okay, yeah. Well, the NASA being broken off from the secret space program is still trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, okay, fair enough. So That's so amazing. I just, uh, you know, I can't, I can't say there's an alternative space program. I haven't seen it. I haven't touched it. I haven't met anybody who worked there. Well, well, seen. well, wait, wait, wait. If you went into Area 51, you sure as, you're, you sure as hell did at that well, time. That, that, isn't that an interesting take? That's and you're grounded in that way. And then you're right, coming from me, that's a real odd thing to be saying. <laughs> but you gotta remember, I only saw a very precise thing that only dealt with me, what I was working on, 
Although I did see some strange other things down there, but you, I didn't you have, did. Yeah, I didn't. And I want to get to that part of the story because, you know, we, we don't have all night. I, I'm going to stay with you as long as it takes though. Let me say that. Okay. So um, now at this point, let's just bring the story. So you're at the point where you're actually building your rocket, right? Yeah. But what we've done now is we've ran it through all of the different mechanical phases and, um, and I wasn't alone. I had, um, I had mathematicians helping me. I couldn't do all of it by myself, it's just too much. But I was the only one that knew how all the final assembly goes together. So that still kept me in charge. But LeMay and, and actually Colonel uh, Williams, they were the faces and, and eyes and ears, voices of the project. They kept me buried away because of a very simple reason. Who's going to want to work with a teenager? <laughs> and this is 1966, 67, 68. Do you know what? Remember how you might not even be old enough to remember this, but they talked very condescendingly to teenagers, not like today. I mean, they're really, they were really down on you back then. So we decided to be a very wise thing not to let anybody know I was really the guys putting it all together. And it's, for better or lack of terms, it's my brainchild is what I came up with. So they were smart. He was very smart. I mean, LeMay was just a very shrewd, clever man. So anyway, he's running this operation, and then um, other people get involved. Congressman John Ashford, that's the local congressman. He's now involved in this thing. And um, now, is he that, is he still alive or not? No, he died. Uh, he was killed. He was poisoned to death by oh. Doctor Rudolph. Arthur Rudolph. That's the other character. That's another character gets involved. In okay, so what was his name? Is was Congressman what John? Ashbrook. He ran for president of the United States in 1972. And he was poisoned by this guy Rudolph, huh? Yep. They won't admit that. Boy, the family members are still pissed off about that. Right. We have them on the biography that we're making. We have them on camera. And the relatives, um, family of uh, John Ashbrook, is so mad about the situation. He, uh, he got sick. And I mean, he got sick really fast. And this is a this is an Ohio farm boy. They don't get sick. But he's, he got sick in the stomach and he died so fast. Oh, uh, okay. Didn't, they didn't have time to sanitize his congressional records. And that brings another big point up in the story. Uh, Cindy Pruitt, who is the producer of uh, uh, Human Rights Productions in um, Agora Hills, California, uh, she is making the biography on me and so she takes the camera crew and she asks me uh, where do we go first see I think nobody's ever came to me unlike her willing to put up the money and time and effort to go because we went to seven different states 2,500 miles and four and a half decades back in time I'm the only person that knows where all this stuff is where it was done so I said, the first place we're going to go is Ashland, Ohio. Well, why is that? Well, that's the library of Congressman John Ashbrook. We're going to go to his library. And we did. And so the camera gets out of the car and it walks up and walks right into the building. And there's the curator waiting for us. He goes back to the vault, spins the wheel, opens up a big door, and he brings this tray of letters out. The first letter he lays down, the camera zooms right into it. And I said, read that letter. And she does. And it says, um, I'm paraphrasing the letter, uh, while uh, John Ashbrook is out of the office running for president, uh, we are in the process of obtaining the Titan missile for you. Now, hold on a minute. You're what? You're obtaining a Titan rocket for me. The letter is dated 1970. I was born in 1954. How old am I? I'm 15 years old. And this letter of Congress with their stationary letterhead and stamp on it, Congress is in the process of handing over an ICBM Titan missile to me. That's a 130-foot-tall rocket, state-of-the-art intercontinental ballistic missile. It takes a military escort to move it. And you're handing that over to a 15-year-old? Don't you find that a little strange? And 
I asked Cindy that question. Her mouth is hanging down looking at the letter. She goes, what in God's name is going on? I said, it's something that, that is part of this project. I built the engine, but I don't have a rocket body. So I asked General LeMay, what's the most powerful rocket body you got in the entire arsenal? Well, that's a Titan missile ICBM. So he said, do you need one? I said, I don't know. I have to look at it. <laughs> And so the letter is starting the approval process of handing me an ICBM Titan missile. Uh, yeah, that's that's amazing. Yes, absolutely. Well, it gets better. There are 13 more letters behind it. Remember, they didn't have time to sanitize his records. He died so quickly. Right. My story is in those letters documented by the United States Congress. Excellent. And you can go up there for yourself and ask to see the letters, and they'll show them to you. So anyway... Um, so what happened was I looked at the rocket and I examined it and General May came to me and said, well, what do you think about the rocket body? I said, um, I said, uh, let me answer your question with a question. What's the last thing going through a mosquito's mind when he hits a windshield at 80 miles an hour? His butt. He goes, what? That's what <laughs> happened to your rocket. That rocket engine will rip right through the rocket. It'll be traveling so fast, that rocket will just come apart like a styrofoam cup. And so General May sits down and says, what are we going to do? I said, it's obvious. I'm going to have to build a rocket body around the engine, one that's designed to take the force of this type of acceleration. And, you know, um, Freeman chimed in to somebody. He said, well, that kind of rocket engine won't work in Earth's atmosphere. Well, he, you know what? He's absolutely right. That's correct. So, you know, give him a little brownie point. Um, that's okay because I'm not really planning to fly the damn thing. What I want to do is do a control burst. Now, a control burst, if I can get the thing to hold together, will tell me if my fields are sustained. And it's very simple how you know that. How do you know your fields sustained? Very simple. Me and Colonel Williams and Rudolph and everybody else at uh, White Sands are not going to be shadows on the wall because we'll be staring at a thermal nuclear blast only a mile away. So if it holds together, the rocket will launch and we'll still be there. And that led to another whole scene that was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Any, that's what all that was about with the ICBM and the letters of Congress. And once again, there's the letters of Congress in the Congressional Library. And do you know what the job was of, of uh, Congressman Ashbrook? He was head of internal security of Congress. He was the chairman. Can you imagine the power that guy wielded? Hmm. Okay. So how do you Photoshop that letter? I've had idiots tell me that's a Photoshop letter. Yeah, uh, right. Right. So anyway, um, <laughs> now, now we're into a whole nother task of things to do. We have got to build a body. And I'm, so I designed a, a rocket. <laughs> it's unlike any rocket you've ever seen. The rockets that you see in the newspaper clips uh, in my story, that's all over the place, internet, YouTube, all that stuff. That is actually the rocket we drug around. I did, I've won so many awards for that rocket engine. It was a flyable rocket. It was using standard cryogenic fluids and engines. But it was the perfect thing to drag to state fairs and, uh, and the national science fairs, all this stuff. And so when they see us moving rockets around at my place, big ones like that, they wouldn't even notice Piffman. It just looked like, oh, that's David and his rockets. LeMay loved it. He said, what a perfect <laughs> smoke job. My God, he said, did you come up with this? I said, yeah, I just had to think we need to drag something around as a decoy. But it needs to be functional. So we had two of them. But no one's ever seen Piffle. Uh, you're about to because um, uh, an artist named Mark McCandless I have uh, partnered up with. And his story is interesting in itself. But his understanding of, uh, of aerospace uh, and aviation in the real world is amazing. So he's going to be perfect to draw everything that uh, I'm talking about. He'll draw my engine, he'll draw the rocket, he'll draw the alien engine, 
Okay, now I thought he I thought he was gonna have some of that stuff at the conference. So you're saying that stuff wasn't done or no. Um Sam, you people have no idea how complex this is. <laughs> he has spent a hundred and ten hours just working out the plasma ducts of right. the alien engine. Right. All right. It's not something you just whip off in a day. Oh, look what I found. Look what I mean. You know, this is really hard work. And right. if it's lucky that I'm born with this stupid eidetic memory, and I just like a camera, I remember everything. And it's taken hours and hours and hours of details. And Mark asked so many questions, but he's he's closing in on it. Uh, we after about a hundred hours, we now have the plasma ducts are coming into view, and I'm starting to see for the first time. It's a trip for me. For the first time in my life, outside my head. I'm starting to see images of Pistol coming back. Thanks to him. Oh, fabulous. It's, yeah. It's amazing. Wait till you guys see this stuff. It's well, just, I, I, I think I should have Mark back on my show. I've had him on my show. We've interviewed. I've met him in person as well. I, uh, you think he'd be willing to uh, talk about this? Is he able to? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I told him, feel free to talk um, all he wants. There's some things we can't talk about for proprietary reasons. All right. Uh, and that right there brings home, it's not fantasy, it's real. So they've got patent concerns on some of this stuff. All right. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, he can talk about, he's a, he's a great little narrator and um, just a sweet guy, just a really nice man. Yeah, he's and, a very uh, nice man, absolutely. Very nice to talk to, and that makes it even easier for me. Um, but yeah, he um, he's really getting a handle on this thing, and. Uh, all right, so so, so you're going times. around, you're going around, and you're you've got a, a faux rocket, so to speak, uh, that's sort of pit, pitch hitting for you uh, at these fairs, I guess, whatever. And meanwhile, yeah. you've got your actual rocket. So the rocket is done. What happens? Right. Okay, you know, to move the story along, what happens next? Okay, well, we skipped thousands of details, but that. <laughs> we only got some well, you know, I'd love, I mean, I'd love to hear those details. Are they going to be in your documentary? Yeah, they are. And um, uh, there's another tape we're making where I will take time to explain all the details, just short of proprietary stuff. But uh, Mark's job is very simple. I just told him, draw everything that's in my head. Can you imagine how much that is? <laughs> so he's no. working on it. He's going to be partner for years with me to get all this done. But in the end result, every one of you out there is going to get to see all this stuff. And the way he draws, it looks like a photograph. Oh, very so good. Yeah. See all the detail. That's why it's taking so long. It's just so detail. Not airbrushing anything. We're putting a plumbing in this thing. Mm -hmm. So right. um anyway, just to get the story rolling, um I finished assembling I build a body for Pifflin. It's built around the engine. And when I got through with it, oh, my God, you're to see this rocket. It's like nothing you've ever, it does not look like a rocket that you know. It looks like something. I mean, it, it looks like it would leave Star Trek in the dust, and it would. <laughs> really? So it's so fast. But anyway, um, we get it assembled. We get it put together. We put it in a, um, um, what was that? Oh man, um, Lawson's Milk, really big in um, Ohio. So we put the rocket in a Lawson's milk truck, a real big one. It's like a transfer truck, oh. but it it has the commercial Lawson's milk signs on it. And um, there were some other things we had, and every vehicle we had was just sky like that. That's what we may wanted. So we drove to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And when we get there, um, there's this plane called a Starlifter. It's a C-141 Starlifter. And there's this ring of um, heavily armed uh, airmen around this thing. And when we pulled up, they parted and we drove in and unloaded the rocket. And I just standing there looking around and it really freaked me out. All of this military might and hardware and this base is all for my rocket. And I'm going, this is a trip, man. I had no idea it was going to go like this. 
uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm just so busy building it. But we get on the star lifter and we leave and we fly to White Sands Missile Testing Ground. Uh, we land there and we roll Piflum out of the star lifter into a hangar. And that's where we start prepping everything. And then this uh, next day, this black DC-9 lands. And I made a joke about where's the white bunny hit? Now, if you don't know that, at that time, in 1971, Hugh Hefner had a black DC-9 with a white bunny hit on it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I was making a joke, which I thought was pretty good. I look up at uh, Colonel Williams, and he ain't smiling. He just looks really worried. And I said, something I need to know? He goes, yeah. Um, he said, do you, do you remember a guy that uh, Dr. Von Braun told you about? I said, yeah, the guy that uh, was a Pina Monday responsible for 100,000 people being murdered uh, in the slave works of uh, metal works where they built the B-2. And they said, yep. Uh, he just showed up. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> oh, out came these guys in black suits and mirror sunglasses. So help me in the middle of the desert. Can't believe it. And I, I told him, I thought, you know, you should dress a little lighter. And the one guy came out behind him, had khakis on and shorts, and kind of looked like um, he looked just like uh, somebody off of Mutual Walmart Wild Kingdom. Looked like Jim. And I said that guy knows how to dress. And that's when Colonel Williams said, that's him. And I got a good look at him. And I went, oh, my God, it's the guy in the photograph that Von Braun showed me. And it's uh, Arthur Rudolph. Arthur Rudolph is not even a real doctor. It's just an honorary title. But he was brilliant. He was really brilliant in propulsion. He designed the F-1 Saturn V moon rocket engine. <laughs> Quite a bit. Now, just... Earlier in the program, I was telling you about them, how powerful they were. So that is quite a brilliant person coming off that plane. But he walks up to me and he asked, um, I asked him, who are you? And he goes, uh, oh, I'm just a guy that goes around looking at uh, propulsion systems uh, that are worthy to look at for the government. Really? Okay. So I understand that you have a kind of a unique propulsion system. I said, yeah, it's in the hangar. You want to look at it? He said, sure. So we walked in. He went on one side of the rocket. I was on the other side. And we're looking at each other, and he asked me to open it up. I said, sure. So he thought, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to open it up for you. He said, well, don't you need tools? No, I just need this block of metal. He goes, what are you talking about? Watch. So I rubbed the block of metal down the side of Piffin, and the panel raises up and moves to the side. He goes, what is that? I said, yeah, it's called a dissembler metal lock. It's old technology. It's actually from World War II. What, you don't have anything like it? Oh, man, did he get upset. <laughs> <laughs> so he now got his head down in the, in the engine bay. So I leaned over. I thought this would be a good time telling him something. So I got right by his ear. I said, do you know what you're looking at? That's a power system that has a million times the power of your F-1 engines, Dr. Rudolph. And he raises up. He is red as a tomato. He is so pissed. And he asked me, who are you? And I went, I'm just a kid that launches rockets in the cow fields of Ohio. <laughs> and so it went downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> but he took over instantly. He took over the project. Von Ron said he would. And even uh, Colonel Williams said that's going to happen. And he had Colonel Williams arrested and house arrest in his quarters. You're kidding. So, yep. So he's taken over complete control. So anyway. Um, well, what happened to you when he did that? Well, he just looked at me and he told me, you will finish prepping the rocket. You will get it ready for launch. You will change the landing coordinates to exactly what I will give you. And he gave me different coordinates. And I said, but wait a minute. I can drop this rocket right back down on top of us. We won't even have to walk a mile or two and pick it up. You're wanting this thing to go down, I guess, I'm just guessing, 456 miles northwest of here. 
in a place called Groom Lake. Why in God's name do you want to drop my rocket in a dry lake bed? And uh, he said, just do it. And so I knew things were not going well. So I had to make a phone call to my parents. And Rudolph said, okay, but they're listening in on the phone. But that's okay, because my dad and I figured out something long ago. This thing might go south, and it did. So I told my dad, who always smoked a Dr. Garbo pipe, uh, Omega pipe brand, I told him, um, if I call and tell you to light your pipe and enjoy the smoke and sit back and relax, um, I want you to go in the lab and burn everything there is. Burn all the rockets, burn all the designs, burn the papers, burn my math book, burn everything. And so I call him and tell him, light your pipe and, and sit back and relax. He said, are you sure? I went, yeah. So um, that comes back in a big way later. Um, so anyhow, now with everything back at home burnt, the only thing left is me and Pistolum. And I knew that we were going somewhere, but I don't know where. So, um, and I knew Colonel Williams has been pretty much contained. And I asked Colonel Williams, have you gotten to um, a phone or radio or anything? Tell General May what's going on. He goes, no. He said, they got me on a short leash. So I went, damn. So anyhow, um, we prep and we launch. And I'm, I could go into tons of details of launch. You had to see this thing to believe it. Um, first of all, no one's ever seen the launch of an electromagnetic fusion containment rocket. Not even today. But no one has ever heard one. That was something I forgot about. I didn't think about it. The sound are just like something of another world. Uh, it's not like a rocket engine sound. But anyway, keep on moving here. The rocket goes up. And it hits an altitude of about 122 miles, 662,000 feet up. And with that, I didn't need any engine power. I am just glide slope. And I glided back to an area called Groom Lake, Nevada. And that's the only name I ever knew that place by. I never heard Area 51 uttered by anybody. In 1971. So, um, we leave uh, to join the rocket. So we okay. Does off. Does Williams come with you then? No, he's locked up. He's, oh I wow! Him. That's really bothered me when I heard. No, he's under. Uh, he's just being detained. I said, for what? He said, well, he's not allowed to go where we're going. So. He just tells me to get on board, and I'm going, why are we going to a dry lake bed? So when we get there, and uh, <laughs> this is an interesting thing. If you check all my tapes, which I'm sure a lot of you will, you'll see I say there are twin 10,000-foot runways. But you never hear me say anything about operational and that we ever landed on those runways. They weren't done. They were chalked out, staked out, string. What we landed on was a partially finished, what I think would be a taxiway later for the big runways. And I'm looking at that, and the first thing I thought about was, why would they want to build such massive runways on a dry lake bed? You're gonna, it's not bedrock. So you're going to have problems with your runway, but it wasn't my business. But um, obviously, we didn't have any trouble landing the DC-9. It just landed right on the small... Um, I guess taxiway, whatever, but things, they landed just fine. And uh, I understand um, somebody told me that John Lear had a problem with me. Yeah, I, I, because I just talked to John Lear, and I, he said, well, he doesn't believe you because there wasn't two runways at that time when you were there and so-and-so. He said one of them, exactly. in fact, was had a big break in it or something like that, and it was still being constructed. But y He's you right. basically knew that. Yeah, he tried. And it, odd, he makes statements like that and didn't even bother asking me. Nobody <laughs> asked me for details about and, the runway. And you know, and he knows you. He he knows you, right? No, 
I've never met him. Oh, you never I've met John. Him. I thought you guys had talked. No, I've never met him. Well, I can um, put you in touch with him. He's a great guy. I just did a five and a half hour interview with him. Yeah, well, or somebody just enlightened him about the runways. Um, find me a tape where I said we landed on the runways. We never did. It's just uh, they were just mapped out, staked out strings, chalk, all it was. And it, a lot of, you could tell they were getting ready to do a lot of construction there. So it was something they were planning to do, but no. See, I'm told, I'm told and asked by a lot of people, don't give details. See what happens when you don't give details? John Lear, don't believe me. <laughs> That's okay. okay but I made my point about yeah, details. We're going to set them straight, so don't worry about well, it's that. Well, it's make the critics shut their stupid mouths. Right. Because I've got the answers. I just don't. I'm told not to give out all the details. If you live it, you've got thousands of details in your brain. You know. That's you, right. That. You know. God, am I? And I will say something in defense of John. If that's all the issues he's got with me, God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, we'll find that out because I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to him about that. So it's all cool. Um, let's continue. So you land oh. at this Groom Lake um, with how many other people are with you? Is it just uh, this Dr. Rudolph or how many other people are, are oh, part of the team? No, he's got black suits with him, about three or four of them people. You got the flight crew. And there were several other, and that was really interesting, several people jumped on board catching a ride from White Sands to there. Right. I, I thought, I, and they wouldn't say a word to me. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even talk to me. I'd ask them, oh, hi, who are you? I'm not a word. They just stare out the window. <laughs> so I, uh, I was asking, them, do you work where we're going? <laughs> not a word. So I don't know who, who they all were, but that, no, we were not alone. Okay. And uh, when we get out of the plane, they all take off in different directions. Um, they had people meeting them, so they knew they were coming in. But anyway, um, we stopped at the center hangar. There was three hangars at the time. There was a water tower. There were several other offices, buildings off to the right if you're facing the, the center hangar. And there was some interesting stuff that, you know, here's more detail. The lights on the top of the roofs, they had louvers so the lights would shine down right where you're at, but from a distance, you'll never see those lights. Hmm. Uh, they're hiding their lights, which I thought that was odd. Why would they hide their lights on these airplane, aircraft hangers? Um, so they were worried about that for some reason. Anyway, I didn't know what this place was. I hadn't, I hadn't a clue. Just looked like some kind of Air Force base. A lot of construction is being planned. There was construction sites mapped out all kinds of stuff planned so you can tell there was a lot going on uh, going to happen there so uh i just thought it was just i actually thought it was part of now it's air force base uh which i guess it is but actually it's not i don't know how it's structured but i didn't think much about it you know what i'm 17 years old and i'm more interested in what's going on with my rocket than me so anyway they pull up in these stupid look i don't know what they were golf carts I, I, I can't even describe it. It looked like big golf carts you see at an airport uh, where you can set, you know, eight or nine, ten people. But they had some kind of power system on them damn things. I just, I don't know what they are. Um, it was, had an intake like a jet engine. There was a light recessed in the back, and whenever they would power up, the light would get brighter like on a rheostat. I didn't see any fuel tanks, no propane, didn't have no type of internal combustion engine. I don't know why it was just this weird hum that it would make. And they were fast for it. I mean, them things were really fast. Um, so I have no idea what that was about. It, and that was the beginning of the whole thing. There was so much stuff I saw there. I didn't have a clue what, it just shouldn't be there. Um, so we go to the center hangar, we get in the golf carts, we get in the center hangar, we're just sitting there and I'm um, just waiting. Um, Okay, I'm looking around. Everybody's like they're waiting for something. So out of the floor comes these little pipes with chains hooked to each pipe. So it makes a parameter of the of the hanger. And this hanger is huge. I mean, it's it. My God, you could put a football field in this hanger. It's really big. So um, 
Well, these little chains and stuff come up out of the floor, it seals off the, the floor area away from everybody. And they had a good reason for doing that because then next thing, the uh, floor just dropped out from under us. <laughs> it's an elevator that big, size of a football field. Imagine one elevator that is. So it's going down, the first thing that's hit me was, well, you can't have chains or cables. It's just the concrete floor alone would be too much. So what is the lifting device here? Well, we got down, dropped down about, I don't know, 20, 30 feet, and then you could see it. Um, there are worm screws in the walls. And a worm screw is like the screw you see in a garage door opener, the, the big bar that just turns and turns and turns, and it raises the door up and down. Okay. Worm screws are the most heaviest load-bearing things you could possibly ever build. But the size of these worm screws were the size of sequoia trees. Wow. Gigantic. And there's like 12 of them. And I thought, man. Just one of those worm screws would be enough power to lift that concrete floor. What's the other 11 for it? Whatever they're picking <laughs> up and down there, it must be really friggin' heavy. Uh -huh. I mean, super heavy. Um, so I thought, that's interesting. So we're riding down, we go down, and I'm trying to count off the feet that we're moving, and I think we go about 200 feet down. And, uh, and it, it flushes out at the floor and uh, three sides of us are, are walls of the elevator, then out straight out front is, um, I don't know what you call it, a causeway. It's just a giant causeway. It has an arcing roof that looks like an arch. It goes down to about 50 feet from the ceiling, so maybe 75 feet, and then the walls counter straight down so they're perpendicular to you. And I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. And But here's the thing. As far as the human eye can see, I get vision back in. You can't see the end of it. It just goes like out into infinity. But you can see a curve in the floor. It's curving with the curvature of the earth. That's how big this place is. And so I had a natural question. Uh, I asked everybody on, on the golf cart, and I went, man, what'd you guys do with all the dirt? And they got so damn mad about that. <laughs> they just did not like that question at all. And I just made it as a joke, but they were very sensitive. And every time we drive in the Southwest, that's uh, we always joke about that. Because yeah, we just, see these big old mounds of dirt that are just, you know, they're supposed to be mountains or natural mountains or whatever, but they're not. They're just mounds of dirt, and that's what they did with the dirt. Yeah, I asked them, uh, but they got really mad about it, you know. And I, <laughs> because I didn't see any dirt up above other than just normal piles of dirt moving right. stuff around. So I said, just looking straight ahead, you know, you got a couple of mountains somewhere, and, boy, they got annoyed by that. And uh, I think I could tell I hit a nerve on that one. So... I just sat back in the seat and I stick my arm out because I noticed something else. Here's the next crazy thing. Um, the luminosity there is absolutely perfect. It's got to be registered with the retina of the human eye. It's just perfectly illuminated everywhere. There's no bright spots, no hot spots of light. And I stick out my arm and look at the floor and there's no shadows. So. So there's no light fixtures. How the hell is the place lit up? It's lit up so perfectly with no shadows. None. Anywhere. Not on anything standing on the floor, the golf cart, nothing. And I'm going, how are they doing? And there's no indirect lighting. It's just lit. <laughs> I still like to know how they did that. I have over the years, the only thing I could theorize, somehow the atmosphere itself is the luminosity. You're breathing your own light. I don't know what, I don't know how they could do something like that. But so we go down the causeway and we're moving along at a pretty good clip. And um, you can see along the walls, there's shops, there's offices, there's labs, there's hangar bays, paste uh, ever so often. 
And in the hangar bays, they have sliding doors, but some of the doors were open, you know, maybe 40, 50 feet, which going by at a pretty good speed, I'm still able to make out what's going on in some of the hangar bays. And man, there was some aircraft, I don't know, aircraft, spacecraft, I don't know what they were. One of them looked like a, um, a big teardrop. And the teardrop, the front of it was glass with uh, painted off sections. So it's a cockpit window of some kind. You can see a seat in there. And the thing tapered back till where it looked like a manta ray. It's really strange. And there was a square design at the very center in the back, which I would assume that's the exhaust. And the only thing I can think of at that time, anything close like that, that might have been a pulse engine. I don't know. But anyway, Mark McCandless was listening to it and I described it and uh, he said, I think you just saw the first generation Aurora. I went, really? You got me, bud. So um, anyway, and these were not models because there were power units. Uh, I'm familiar with the units called NC-8. And they supply electrical power to uh, aircraft when they're being worked on. There's also air conditioning hoses. So there's somebody inside that thing working that needs, you know, air. And well, um, what about UFOs? Did you see a round craft, you know, a UFO, no. traditional? Nope. 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 Didn't see anything like that. All right. There were, there were drip pans under this thing that looked like a teardrop. And uh, so it, these are operational crafts, whatever they are. Um, did see some I did recognize, uh, not exactly the same way I remembered it. But anyway, uh, do you remember the Valkyrie? The XB-70. All right. I remember? I, I'm not well, an expert on this kind of thing, but I'm going to look it up. Yeah. Hey, well, the XB-70 was sitting there, or something looked extremely close to it. But it had some other designs in the air ducts, and the exhaust area was different. Uh, now, I know there was only two built. One of them was destroyed in a crash in the desert on the test flight. The second one was shipped off to... Um, my parents in Air Force Base where it sets today, you can see it. Uh, I don't know what this thing was, uh, but it looked same size and configuration as Delta Wing of seven, six engines of an XB-70, but it looked like it had some kind of modification, so. Oh yeah, that, it, that's a very beautiful plane. Yeah, it's considered by aviation experts the most beautiful plane ever created. Yes. And, um, it's an interesting story in itself. If you're not familiar with it, it can cruise at 85,000 feet at 2,000 miles an hour. We don't have anything today to touch that in altitude or speed. And it was designed in 1958. <laughs> Where did they get that technology? Well, it went black is what that means. I personally know something about the Valkyrie, why it was built. You know who the original designer of the Valkyrie was? No. General Curtis LeMay. Oh, right. Cool. He okay. designed it to replace the B-52s. He wanted the 45 of them built to replace the B-52s, and he'd have his fleet of Valkyries. Him and Robert McMamer, remember that name? Yep. That's the Secretary of Defense. They went into a huge fight over it, and uh, eventually uh, McMamer fired LeMay as Joint Chief and threw him out. Uh, LeMay was the one that said to uh, North, uh, to Hanoi in North Vietnam, if you don't come to the Paris Peace Talks and talk to us, I will bomb you back into the Stone Age. And that got him fired by Robert McNamara and started him <laughs> in my direction. Jeez. But anyway, um, that was his, his nickname is Bombs Away LeMay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What a guy. Yeah. So, um, anyway, the, what, Later, the Valkyrie in its design will come back and hook more dots together. I didn't know it at the time. All right. But I did later. Um, anyhow, we're still going on down uh, the causeway. We go for a while, and um, this place is huge. And when we got down to where we were, and you look forward, still no end in sight. I don't know how many miles that thing went, the causeway. That's very cool. All right. And how uh, can I ask you, you know, because you're, you're actually saying it goes um, indefinitely forward, but what about the width? Oh, the width, it had to be 
I'd say about 150 feet wide. Okay. Is that pretty big? I don't um, know. Is that the, the, the width of a football field or less? A football field, we, you know what? Now think about it 300 feet. Twice that size is over 300 feet wide. You could put a football field down through there. All right. So, whatever they were moving up and down through there, it was big or it could accommodate some really big things. Okay. Uh, and know, and you things. were on this very, this small little, you know, golf cart thing, but you said it goes really fast. How fast did it go? Uh, well, I found out later when we were out there with uh, Pithlum how fast you know, it, it, we had to be doing about 60 or 70 miles an hour, not in the causeway. But when they were running away from Pithlum that was about to detonate, they got to, we had to be doing about 60 or 70 miles an hour. This thing was just touching the high spots in the ground. <laughs> we were flying. Okay. Uh, and how many moving. people were on this thing when you were it, on it? Uh, there was me, the driver. Rudolph, uh, four other personnel, which they were Air Force. Their uniforms are very strange. Uh, they didn't look like Air Force uniforms. Um, they were some kind of uniform, but I just just don't recognize any uniform like that. And the other thing that was interesting, no name plates. If we have uniforms today. Everybody has a name plate, right? You can see the holes in the shirt where they've taken the name plate off. What about uh, what about upside down triangles? No, I didn't see any emblems or logos. Okay. Uh, they were like jumpsuit, you know, one right. zipper up front and a belt. Um, but they. Uh, what color were they? Uh, royal blue, really deep blue. Uh -huh. And um, I just you know the hats were strange. Well, they they were beret type hats. Oh, really? Uh, in colors and uniform. And you could tell they had emblems at one time because you could see shadows of where they, it looks like they removed a lot of things. So these, I don't know, maybe it's just for the day for me, but they, they just really pretty much blanked out these uniforms. So you couldn't tell what emblems or what relationships. So they had. could and you no, tell rank? No rank. That's the other thing. The rank pins were missing off the collars. Okay. Uh, except for the colonel of the base. He was there and he had his uh, birds on his collar. But everybody else didn't have any insignias. Of okay, any the kind. colonel of the base, do you know who he is? No, not that time. Um, and I'm only assuming he was a commander because uh, he had his. He had his um, insignia zone and everybody was constantly uh that was in uniforms was constantly uh, uh obeying his instructions or whatever and he was very quiet he didn't say much at all um can you describe he, him uh, the reason no, he, i'm asking you is because sean david morton has a guy who was running that base who uh was in charge and it's possible he was in attendance that day when you were there and he joined us he joined us when we were in the hangar sitting there waiting to for the floor to drop that's when he showed up right before the floor went down he got in came out from the hangar area office area and walked out and got in the uh, cart with rudolph and those two sat side by side okay would rudolph report to him or vice versa vice versa Oh yeah, absolutely. You kidding? Rudolph was Rudolph was running the show, and uh, whatever he said, that's what everybody did. So I know you remember conversation, but so on the way to the vehicle, you're not having convers. There's no conversation, or you don't. What would you say about that? No, they they were very quiet, and um, they were watching me back there. And they, when I was waving my arms around, uh, they knew I picked up on the lighting. And um, so I think they realized for a 17 year old, I might have been a little bit sharper than they were used to. <laughs> okay. And they started being very careful. Um, the driver stopped the vehicle and he jumps off and he goes over to. Now, all the doors that we had been seeing at this point are sliding hangar doors. Um, and they enter um, layer, you know, like in different sections. 
standard um, doors of hangers, but not this door. When we got up to it, the first thing I noticed was, oh man, you got to be kidding. This thing is over 100, maybe 130 feet in diameter, and it's an iris, like a camera lens, mm. an iris. And I thought, my God, imagine the expense it takes to build an iris door of that size. That thing caught my attention. And so the guy jumps out and goes over to the wall and he puts his hand on this glass plate thing and he looks in this, you know, visor looking thing, like a tunnel coming out of the side of the wall. There's a flash of light and uh, the iris door opens. So he's getting back in the buggy and I'm watching this and I'm going, what the hell did I just see? Was that a retina scanner and a palm scanner? We don't have anything like that. We don't even have, there's no faxes, no modems, no pages, no uh, uh, laptops, no cell phones. Uh, we didn't even have a handheld calculator yet. That'll come years later with uh, Texas Instruments. Um, at that time, all I had was two slide rulers. And... Um, and this guy's looking at a retina palm scanner. Don't you find that a little odd? <laughs> I sure did. And I started to ask him, what's up with the door locks? And nobody had said a word. <laughs> <laughs> so the iris opens up and this uh, uh, plate slides across the floor once the iris clears so you have a solid floor to drive over. And we roll into the room, and the room's pitch black. But when we start going in, the lights come up. So I'm thinking, all right, we might see some light fixtures. I'm looking around everywhere, the lights are coming up, no light fixtures. Stick out my arms, no shadows. Perfectly illuminated. I'm like, man, how do they do that? It just drives me nuts. Now I asked them, what, what's up with the lights? Nobody's answering anything. <laughs> Okay, and is there any sound? I mean, you're in, you're going into this place. Is there any sound? That's that weird hum on that golf cart thing. Uh huh. When we come in, um, we drive to the end of the room. The place is big as a gymnasium, and we go to the far end, and there's this steel uh, structure, cross beams, with a uh, like a stage. It's built like a big all steel platform stage. And there's these weird looking curtain type things hanging down off of cables. The cables go up in the ceiling, but they just disappear into the ceiling. I don't know what what's going on with them things. So when I say curtains, I don't mean a cloth curtain you could run up and pick up a look under its skirt. These are like rubber uh, um, semis with the big mud flaps. Did you ever pick up one of the flaps? <laughs> they will surprise you. They weigh about a hundred pounds each. Uh, they're extremely heavy. Uh, this is the same kind of material, rubber, but the size that they were, it must have been thirty feet tall. Uh, they've had to weigh tons. So nobody's going to run up. You know, not even if you're the Hulk. Maybe the Hulk could, you know, pick it up and look under and see what's in there. So obviously it's a, they don't intend to have anybody sneaking a peek uh, with these curtains. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at Rudolph and he motions me to step out and I do. And then uh, the driver gets over to this panel and he, Rudolph just gives him a wave and he raises the curtain and the curtain goes up and I, I was excited and disappointed at the same time. Um, I was excited to see what they had sitting there, but I was disappointed because I thought I was ahead of everybody. What they're sitting there is now my engine, electromagnetic fusion containment engine, is about two feet long and probably about 15 inches in diameter. This thing is an electromagnetic fusion containment engine the size of an 18 wheel semi with a cab. It's over 70 feet long. It's got to be about 15 feet high and about 22 feet wide. And the reason I know those dimensions is I actually stepped them off when they weren't looking. Uh, they, um, 
that'll come later in the story. But anyway, I'm trying okay, to Okay, so idea. wait one second, because you said he lifted the curtain. How did he lift the curtain? Well, he flipped a switch, and the cables go up in the ceiling, and they pull the curtain with it. All right, okay. Yeah, you know, it's just a simple raising curtain. Um, so I'm looking at the thing, and Rudolph's looking at me, and he asked me, what do you think? And I'm like, damn, it's... Uh, it's sophisticated beyond my design. He goes, yeah, but you share the same power heart. I went, yeah, we do. Um, I, see, mean, how, I mean, how, wait, wait, I want to slow you down just a minute there because how can you look at something and know it shares the same power as yours? Oh, that's, that's so simple. So simple. Um, you could take a model a, not even a model T, you could take a model a, engine out of the Ford Model A and set it down next to a Lamborghini and you can look at both of them and tell they both are internal combustion engines. One's just way more
command that could blow a hole like this in this thing is because there was all this details. Um, what happened was the blast came through the hull of the craft, came through the hull of the power plant, came in at the point of the eye of the hurricane, and it came through this room, which I believe the diagnostic center. There's another one exactly like it, not damaged on the other side. So it's got left and right diagnostic centers. And there was a chair. The chair is gone. It just remains of it because the blast came through, went through the chair, disintegrating everything in its path, hit the bulkhead just to the right of the, uh, of the seat. And when it blasted through the bulkhead, the next thing it encountered was the plasma containment fields. And let me tell you, the power it would take to knock out the plasma containment fields and something like this, there ain't nothing on earth I know of that could do that. Nothing. We, uh, you could use a hundred nuclear weapons. This thing would eat them. Okay. It'd be lunch to this plasma containment field. Okay. But they, they managed it, whoever it was, right? Whoever it was and whatever they used, it started to pen penetrate the containment field and that's when it shut down saving the rest of the entire engine. Okay, so once this thing, I don't know, when you're on it, at a certain point, does the plasma containment field start running again? No, not why I'm in it. It'll never run again because the bulkhead was damaged. That is part of the, they, you know, that you bring up a technical question. The way the plasma is, travels through this engine is different than mine. I wonder why. <laughs> it's, it's alien. Um, I use these, uh, something really trying to get across to uh, Mark as he draws this stuff. I had these plasma veins that I could use in the magnetic coils to shape the direction of the plasma I wanted to go in. In this case, it was a, an infinity pattern. Theirs did the same. But on the inside of the plasma chamber, I can see it. I could, I could slid on down further into the plasma chambers and walk through it. That I built mine with a microscope. <laughs> now I can walk down, standing up through this thing. You got to imagine what that's like. So, but okay. So you were a, did you do that or you didn't do that? No, I do it. I, I, was, <laughs> I was having enough to deal with. But um, would it have been dangerous residual plasma? No, or something? no, because it has it has shut its main drive down, and it's not going to start it back up, and it won't because, um, and that's what I'm getting to. There were these stations of some kind that looked like giant crystals. I don't know how to describe it. It's like giant crystals. They were white and green. And they were directed in line of sight of each other. And I believe the plasma would, were controlled by these crystals. And that's how they controlled their plasma flow. I use magnetic fields to move mine. They're using some kind of crystal something. So would the plasma, the plasma would not dissolve the crystal? No, because they're encased in their own electromagnetic field. They are, the, they are the originating force of the magnetic field. That's what my point is. The one crystal section right by the diagnostic station was vaporized. So you can't ever turn the engine back on because you've got to replace that crystal section. Uh, whoever built this thing, they would have to do that because otherwise they're not going to have continuity. And you've got to have continuity in the field, fields or you're not going to have an engine. And that's where everybody's stuck today. See, what we're talking about is the holy grail of physics on Earth. Mm -hmm. If you can get fusion containment, man, you've got Star Trek, you've got unlimited power, it's, it's all kinds of things happen. Um, okay, when you say fusion, are you talking about cold fusion or not? No, no. I just said the temperature these engines run at is 50 million degrees centigrade. Does that sound cold? No, but... Right. Well, cold fusion is full. It, 
until okay. you show me a running cold fusion process, it's not possible. Okay, so it's another kind of fusion. Right. It's Wait, a plasma, I mean, I really a plasma you, fusion. You can tell you hit a nerve with me. It's, I get irritated with this. Um, <laughs> I'm not talking about cold fusion. It has nothing to do with it. All right, it. I'm just now. clarifying. That's all right. Right. I'm, I'm working with an orange. Uh, cold fusion apple is something else. Uh, I have nothing to do with that. All right. Uh, but the fusion containment, it's hot. God almighty, it's hotter than any sun in nature. And that's what gives you such power, too, by the way. But um, Okay, I'm now I, I want to ask you something about this. Isn't it possible? I mean, I know that what happens here is this engine even turns on a little more when you, when you put your hand somewhere on the... Yeah, well, there's these diagnostic pods. I don't know what else to call them. And it's got a certain shape of digits that you can emulate with your hand. Um, there are a total of four digit places. Um, three of them are for fairly long flanges with a, a opposing digital thumb, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's what they had, I don't know. But if you take your hand, the human hand, and hold it up, you're looking at the back of the hand right now. Take your ring finger and your middle finger and put them together. Hold them tight. Then spread your little finger and your index finger out and move your thumb, stick it straight out. That is what I was looking at on those pods. If you set your hand down in those grooves, which are recessed down into the pod, uh, your hand will fit. Okay, so, but not a, it's not made for a human hand. No. It, it doesn't have five digits, it's got four. It's got three big digits and a thumb. Okay, so you put your hand down there, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, it really wasn't smart, but so I stick my hand down in there, and um, uh, these are definitely diagnostic ports. It's designed for somebody, and also whoever's interacting with this thing, they're bipedal answer points because the chair told me that. The remains of it. It has a seat, a cutout where you drop your legs and feet to the floor, and you, and then a back of the chair. That means that whatever's sitting there is a bipedal answer point. And um, is there a height? Uh, you know, do your feet reach the floor? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I fit in the chair. What was left of it, I fit in just perfect. So they're looking at, you know, you're looking at a five foot. 10 bipedal answer point. Okay, could, when you, when you went to sit in the chair and put your hands there in the um, controls, I guess, uh, right. uh, is everybody able to see you still? Can they see what you're doing? No, they can't see a thing. I'm down recessed inside the engine. I'm out of sight. But occasionally, Rudolph would ask, you okay? And I would say, yeah, so they could hear me. And um, that's how he kept track of me. If I stopped answering, I'm sure they would have come running. But um, so I sit down, I put my hand in the grooves, and um, that really wasn't smart. <laughs> now I think about it. Because um, as soon as I did, uh, these rings, sleeves, come interlocking up from the bottom to the top all the way up to my knuckles. It just these sleeves went over each, all, all, uh, all four digits was just covered by these sleeves at really super speed. Just, you know, they just ching, 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 and they're up to my knuckles. And then they start tightening down. And that's when I'm about to freak. Because I don't have one, I have both hands, one on each pod, left and right, opposing thumbs. And this thing's locking down and it's getting so tight, I think they're going to cut all 10 of my fingers off. So I start to scream, and all I get is this. I hear, I hear something, but I don't know if I'm hearing it through my ears or all I hear is this Lauren Bacall voice, very sultry, just saying, you know, Shh, be quiet. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, okay. <laughs> and, um, and 
the grip lightened up just a little bit, but it's still pretty tight. I'm definitely not going to be able to pull my fingers out. So I just had to sit there and see what happens next. And, um, and at this point, I'm going to skip what happens next. Um, it's just for my own personal reasons. Um, but anyway. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. So are you saying that you're going to skip whatever this is for personal reasons because you never did reveal it so far or what? I have off camera with certain people I have. All right. Uh, but I'm not going to go into it in detail on here. All, All right. right. So are. this thing spoke to you in your head or somehow, some way, and you sort of obeyed it in a, in sort of the loose sense of that word. Um, yeah. So, what are you going to do? Well, ten of your fingers trapped in a. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. But you stopped screaming or whatever you were going to do. And I said, calm down. And it's got hold of you like a Chinese uh, handcuff. Remember yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. So then were you scared at that point or did you really calm down immediately? Um, yeah, I think my heart was beating so loud I could hear it. Um, but I figured if there's anything malice with all this, there's nothing I could possibly do about it at this point. But I didn't think I've been through all of this, got to this point, and it's going to be malice. I don't I never felt malice at, of any time at any okay. point, except for the people outside. Right. They always worried me. So, and, uh, okay, so, so you're in this thing, you've got your hands in, and then what happens? Well, there's, um, there's some interaction that goes on, and uh, the pods release my hands. Now I crawl out and there's an entirely different attitude with me about things. Um, Cause I get up on top, I crawl out of the hole, get up on top of the, um, the, I don't know, the exoskeleton plate. Okay. But I have to stop you again. Did you think it was alive at this point? I uh, didn't think I know. Okay. Yeah. This thing, this thing is, it's an ascension entity. And it's as where as me and you. And it knows exactly what's going on. And it's running its own agenda, which I happen to be totally okay with. And um, it absolutely dislikes the people down on the floor, every single one of them. It knows them all personally. Oh. And so it you were, really, so you were, is it because they, you know this because it was telepathically communicating with you this information or do you think uh, that suddenly you were in sort of a symbiotic you know entrainment with it where you were kind of almost part of it well let's say i can describe some things in better detail than i could before for instance the power plant and the spacecraft and the crew all three of them are separate ascension entities, all three. But they all three will connect to each other when they're in operation in a symbiotic system, which is the greatest way on it imaginable to travel through space, is in a symbiotic relationship. So your power plant, your craft, and the crew all know each other, all know what's going on. And if you're ever in a battle situation, if you've been in the Navy like I have for 11 years, we have, um, in our situation, we have something called damage control. And damage control reacts as if the ship is alive and the people who are damage control, they're acting as if they are the ship and they tell the captain what's damaged, how bad, how quickly can we get underway, how fast can you repair this. So, but yet it's actually everybody's separate entities. But now let's redefine that where the ship and the power plant and the crew are all symbiotic and they get hit by something, you don't even have to ask for damage control. You already know where you're hit, how bad you hit, where the enemy is, where the location, all instantaneously. You can retaliate back at them without even having to ask. Damage control, give me a report. Fire control, lock on, get target acquisition. Okay, proprietor fire. fire. None of that crap goes on. It's all instantaneous. Okay, just, so suddenly they, those men on the floor were the enemy. Is that correct? As far as that thing was concerned, yeah. They did not like that crowd at all. And 
there was an impression. They re had a name for him. And they just, they just refused to work with Blackheart, which I thought, interesting term. I don't know if that's for the benefit of, of interactions uh, on the sapiens or what that was about. But Okay, Black Arts? Black Hearts. Black Hearts, okay. And I mean, did you think that this... Out there did, had Black Hearts and they just don't want to talk to them. Did you think the craft was female? Absolutely. And I don't know how a gender base would work in a situation like that. Because if you have a gender base, you open up can of worms to a lot of thoughts. Because that means there's different, there's male, female species. That means there's population. That means they have some kind of way of uh, uh, reproduction. I mean, just all kinds of things. And it's just, I don't know. I've left more, I'm left more with more questions than I get. Okay, answered. so, but at that moment, also, this craft or or being was able to calm you down. You were calm. I was calm through the whole thing until I crawled out and got up and started talking to those people on the floor. And then I just they must need something happened because I suddenly become really hostile and aggressive with them. Uh, actually, I was just fed up with them because the condescending was so sick. He cut with a knife. Uh, I asked him. I said. Um, so this is yours, really. I'll tell you what, this thing's not from the neighborhood, is it, boys? It's not ours. It's not theirs, the Soviets. This thing's from somewhere else. You didn't build it. You ain't got a clue how it works. And I asked you, where's the people build it? And you tell me, well, son, you know, they, you're on summer vacation. They're on summer vacation. I asked you, did they leave any notes? And you say to me, well, boy, you know, you have um, homework. Well, they took their homework with them. Um, but wait and a second. You skipped over something because I remember you telling me that when you came up out of that chamber, so to speak, onto right. the top, you, at some point you touched something again, like the skin, and then it no, no, gave no. off a no, different that's color. Later. That's, that's later? later? Yeah, your brain has not got that registered right. You're out of sequence. All right. <laughs> So we're still heading toward that. So are you still, when you're talking right now, this conversation you're having, is it, are you standing on top of this craft still? Yeah, I'm standing on top of this thing and uh, this power plant, and I'm looking down at them on the floor, and we are in one pitch argument. Oh. And they realize that I just, like, put all the dots together. And Rudolph is very smart. He's figured out something else. He's figured out somebody has told me <laughs> that gave me the key to the answers uh, quiz. So I was suddenly just putting it all together. And so when I told him, I said, um, it's not from the neighborhood. So where, where how did you get this device? Did you shoot it down? They're looking at Did you dig it up when you were digging this place out? And they really got angry in that one. I went, oh, so now I hit another nerve. So you guys probably dug this thing up when you were building this giant, whatever it is underground you got here. Maybe this is why you decided to build this Groom Lake place to begin with, because you found this. Where's this craft that this thing was sitting in? Where's the crew that's with the craft? Did you pickle them in jars? Boy, they really got mad on that one. Um, and, uh, okay, let me ask you, did you, were, were you communicated with, did you suddenly know, did you visualize at all, were you shown a story in which this thing was actually maybe sent you a, a visualization of it being shot down and what its actual craft looked like on the outside? Um, no comment. Okay. <laughs> so it did. And so... In essence, you saw the crash, you saw the attack that it, it went through, but did you get a, a picture of who shot it down at that point? Because it wasn't probably us. Yeah, it's something else. And did you get a picture it, of that something else? Yeah, no. No, I don't have any visuals of it. All right. Other than it's just uh, very big and aggressive. And it's also very, very old. You know, thousands, not maybe billion, multiple billions years old. The thing that shot it down. And the thing that 
got shot down. All right. Old. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I really don't know all what. <laughs> it's hard to make sense of everything and flood them. And, you know, you got to remember, um, you're probably dealing with an intellect where I'm probably a beetle trying to understand a nuclear power plant. You know, it's kind of that situation. It just, I just. All right. Well, you don't seem to be doing so, so badly. Okay. So let's continue the, the story because, you know, we don't have that much time. I think right. people but anyway, are Anyway, I came out and I'm arguing with these guys. And finally, really nasty, they tell me, get down off of the uh, device. And I said, fine. So I'm so pissed off. What I'm pissed off about is that they have this kind of technology, you know, in their control. We know nothing about it. They're not sharing it with no one. Who the hell are these people to make that kind of decision? It's like one percenters. How do you get to control so much? This is the kind of stuff that every person on the planet needs to know about because it affects us all. And I don't care whether you're a Russian or a Chinese or Korean or whatever you are. It doesn't matter. Everybody should know about this because this is the fact that it's a race. And they're making decisions on who gets to know about it and who doesn't. Who okay, what about the race that drove it? Do you have, did you get a visual on those people? Um, but I got a feeling, you know, there's something you should be. Consider this. Not every species in the universe runs on a Julius Caesar calendar. And not every species runs through time in a chronological order. We may be the only ones that does that. Matter of fact, there's other species out there that probably refuse to believe that such a creature could exist as a human being does on a timeline. So the problem is, is that they're in the Navy. We have a pilot that goes down. I'm telling you, it is just maximum priority to go get that guy. And we move instantly as fast as human beings can move and equipment. We are in motion to go get that pilot. Okay. I think everybody understands that and agrees with it. So imagine you got a ship that's down with a crew. They're missing. And what may be, what, 45, 55, 60, 70 years of our time may only be one day to these things. And their rescue crew is in route. So yeah, I'm going to be really pissed off if somebody shows up and they get really angry because some idiots of our race decide to pickle a crew, tear up a ship, cut things up. You All know, right, so you one. seem to have also gotten the conclusion that the pe that the beings in there the, were pickled, as you call them. And so you, you actually, I'm getting that you actually have a sense of what they even look like. Would they look like greys, Nordics, a reptilian, any idea? Not really, just um, just kind of a shadow of a bipedal anthropoid of some type. Okay. But I know this, I sure hate to be sitting here at my home and our planet suddenly gets vaporized <laughs> without us saying a word over something that these dummies have done. And we never, and I get evaporated for, I mean, I'm going to be really pissed off about that. Right. Because, um, you and I and the rest of we're not responsible for this. And if we had a chance to approach it, I think we'd do it in a more humane way than the way they're carrying on. All right. Well, just, uh, but on the other hand, at least based on what you're saying, it wasn't us that shot it down either, right? Oh, I hope that intelligence is big enough to figure out that the rest of us had nothing to do with it. We don't even know what's going on. Well, I mean, but our military didn't shoot it down either, if, if I understand no, what you're saying. But the fact that uh, they're keeping something like that contained, um, that's not good. That's not speaking well of us as a race for those individuals. 
and they don't know if they speak for all of us. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Okay, That's so you had all question. this consciousness uh, when you were coming down, and you and it made you angry. And on top of it... Uh, yeah, let me tell you what happened. I'm on top of it. I'm coming down. And that's where a lot of dots suddenly come together. I'm coming down. I'm at the other sphere now. It's a twin sphere. I'm at the other sphere. When I, my hand hits the smooth surface, it's no longer the blue-white cascading waves going down the hall. It now looks like red-orange flames. And I take my hand away and I'm looking at it and put it back on and I'm going what is this so as I am trying to figure out what's going on with this thing the orange red flames give way to back to the soothing blue white waves I jerk my hand back and then I realize this thing is alive it's a sentient and it's not heat sensitive recognition alloy picking up on radiation this thing is picking up on my feelings <laughs> and I am totally pissed off and it could read it and it was showing it. Then as it calmed down, it also reflected it. So what it's doing, it's reading me like a meter. It knows how I'm feeling and reacting and that opens up a tremendous amount of, um, you know, possibilities of this thing doing so many other things. So it's, it's just, I mean, you're, you're now looking at something that's not just a machine, it's organic, it's inorganic, it's both, it's uh, sentient, it's uh, symbiotic, it's used to interfacing with other organisms of different backgrounds. I mean, my God, what a piece of technology. And, and these dummies okay. just stand there. So does Back. this have, um, does this, in, for you, does this mean that at this point you must know that you're not going to be able to stay there? You're, you're in theory, maybe you know that you're not going to be oh. able to stay in contact with this machine. Is there a sense of, you know, uh, maybe anger mixed in with the idea that you're going to be um, having to leave it? Yeah, well, it's, um, <laughs> I think the biggest joke is going to be on those guys back at Area 51 when they figure out everything. But I have other fish to fry at this moment because I'm now thrown into the golf cart and we're leaving the area. And um, and the curtain comes back down. Now, I know, but before that happened, isn't didn't the machine shut down? Um, no comment. Okay, because you told, well, you told me off the record that you don't no. think it would ever power up again after you left that machine. That was kind of what you at least communicated. It can't. It can't, um, it can't for a, a very simple reason. But, it, yeah, to answer your question, it cannot do, it can never, it can never power up ever again where it's setting. And that's actually a very good thing. Um and they thought they got away with something and they, they really didn't. They lost everything. But when we were on our way back up to the surface, that's when I, my problems were just about to go complex as it could because um, the real reason, the question is this, why did you bring me here? Well, might be because we wanted to show you this electromagnetic fusion containment engine and second reason is damage. You might be able to tell us how it works. And thirdly, you built one almost just like it, and it's up on the desert floor, and that one works. And that's where the problem is. Because as I'm riding back up the surface, I can hear them talking up in front of me, and air carries, air carries sound. So they're whispering, but the whispers are coming right back to me sitting at the back seat of the cart, and I'm listening to them. And they said, if we don't get him to help us figure out how this engine goes, we're never going to get first strike. And I'm sitting there going, what, are they playing baseball? I never heard that term. What is first strike? It's 1971. Not, no one's ever heard that term before. Um, so I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, first strike? What's he going to strike? 
and then I realized, um, and then I just got this impression. And you remember um, LeMay designed the Valkyrie, right. XB-70? Yeah. XB-70 travels at 85,000 feet at 2,000 miles an hour. Makes the B-52 look like a, you know, an old wheelbarrow. <laughs> and what you do, you put inside the, the cargo nuclear bay of the Valkyrie, you put in Pithlin with its incredible speed. So you're coming in at 2,000 miles an hour. You go through failsafe where you are entering the Soviet airspace, and then you drop Pithlin out, and Pithlin cuts across the sky into their silos so fast that they'll see a streak on their radar and they'll ask, what's that? And by the time they get what, there's a flash and they're gone. So all of a sudden, it all makes sense why the Valkyrie was built, why they got this thing involved, got me involved, and they're looking for a first strike counter weapon for a thermonuclear war. The only way you can win MAD, which is what we live under even today, called mutual assured destruction, is to win it by first strike, striking so fast the enemy has no time to retaliate, and you win. Well, I, I asked LeMay about all this, and I said, what about the submarines, the Soviet subs? Oh, we'll estimate we'll lose about 30%, but we find that accept, you know, acceptable. And I'm going, not if you're in the 30%, you won't. You know, this is just madness, every bit of it. Um, so anyway, that's the problem I had. So now we're on our way back up the surface. I've done figured this out what they're wanting and I'm not going to help them and uh, the, the problem I'm faced with is how do you blow up your rocket at a top secret Air Force base and all you got is just yourself so how do you do that a bit of a problem don't you think so we get back up to surface and I got to figure out something I cannot let them have my rocket in its engine because they will figure out the fusion containment drive in in fairly quick order. So I'm sitting there, actually I'm sitting in a golf cart and Rudolph is out talking to the Air Force people and some other guys in black boots and I thought I've got to get out to Pithlin as fast as I can. So I look over at the hangar door and I go, oh man, there's just what I need. So I go over to the hangar door and slide down and sit on the lip of the hangar door right next to the big hub wheel. I reach inside the hub wheel and grab a big glob of graphite grease. So I start yelling, screaming, none of this would irritate Rudolph. I want to see my rocket for you take it and all this stuff. And he thought, just get him out of here. So he puts the two guards, me, in the golf cart, and off we go. So we get out to the desert area where it landed and its parachutes were there. and. Uh, it really looked good. It was such a pretty thing. Um, so I had to, I opened up the doors and I told the guards, stand back, the thing might be leaking. Now they're, they're more than ready to uh, comply because they don't know anything. So I take the graphite grease and I slide into the induction chambers and start up the cyclotron. Ask anybody what happens when deuterium and graphite run into each other. Uh, in the cyclotron status, it's going to be one violent reaction, um, kind of like nitro and glycerin. So anyway. Um, but how did you get that grease into your, did you put it in your pocket? I mean, was it all over your hands? How did you manage that? It's just a glob that's in the center of my palm, and you just close your hand lightly. Nobody sees so it's it. not very big? No, I don't need, my God, I just need a speck. Uh -huh. I don't need much, but more than enough. And uh, anyway, I closed the doors and set the ignition process to uh, 90 seconds. So uh, then I didn't think about something. We, I tell the guards, if things leaking, I think it's going to explode. We better run for it. So we get in the car and we're going really fast. And then the guy asked me a really good question. He said, what is the safe distance? Well, I hadn't thought about it. If it goes nuclear, oh, God, I told him, Chicago? 
<laughs> they didn't like that answer. Uh, so I was hoping it doesn't go nuclear because if it does, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have Green Lake, not as you know it. It's going to be gone. So fortunately, it didn't go. It just went conventional. Boy, it really blew uh, Piffling up into a million of pieces. Uh, I think the biggest thing they ever found was about the size of my thumb. So um, that was the end of that. And that's why the name of my story in the book, uh, people wonder, when are you ever going to put your book? I've had a book inside the computer. It's a 400-page book, and it's called America's Fall from Space. Because on June 20th, 1971, America fell from the space it could have been. It, you basically lost Star Trek. So, okay, but so you at this point, what you've done in in your mind is you have sort of saved the human race from destroying itself by a first strike using your technology, right? No, that sounds very high fluting and noble and everything, and me wonderful, me great. No, not really. Uh, Maybe you can see it. I never saw it that way. I just saw it as I just had to prevent from something I built. I was trying to build a power plant for you. And um, and then the, along the road, I got, um, you know, detoured and derailed into something perverted where you want to build a weapon system. And I never... I never, that was never in my thought. I never thought about building a weapon system with it. Okay, but at 17 so, years old, this is a very sophisticated uh, line of reasoning that you actually had to come to this conclusion right after leaving this alien craft, in essence. Uh, and do you think that the, the craft itself had a, a role uh, maybe in, you know, in a sense, were you in control? communication with it in such a way that it planted that thought for you to do that to your own rocket or do you think that it was only your idea <laughs> that's an interesting question um <laughs> really don't know how to answer that because i don't know where one part begins the other one leaves off can't tell anymore it's kind of blurry um it was very hard to imagine this, 26 and a half months, 24 seven, seven days a week is all you ever did. Very difficult to go to high school and be doing this at the same time. And you've created something that doesn't exist at, at that moment. And the potentials of it is just unlimited. And it would mean so much good for so many people and the, for the entire planet. And it would really change a lot of things. Um, but yet, because powers involved have an entirely different agenda, which is not healthy for <laughs> most of us, they forced me into a situation where I had to destroy the very thing that took me 26 and a half months to build. And it's one of the finest pieces of work I've ever done in my life. And I'm going to have to just disintegrate it. That's, there's no difference than asking a parent to put a gun to their child's head and blow their brains out. You're going to have to kill the very thing you created. Right. So you did this, uh, you know, in, in really a very short period of time between when you left that craft and when you actually... I mean, you were already when reaching the surface. You already planned this event, right. this this right. destruction of your own baby, so to speak. Right. So, at this time, you know, I talked to Mark Richards, Captain Mark Richards, who is a captain in the secret space program, who actually was a little bit taken aback by the story, um, because he ha he is one of the few people who is able to fly an artificially intelligent craft called Minerva that is female, that is comes from another race of beings. And he describes that and his, his being having special abilities to connect with this craft that very few other humans have. And it's a very similar story to what you're talking about with this damaged craft. And, um, 
and it so it's really a fascinating kind of situation we've got here um and yeah, you, I just don't consider, well i don't know his story personally but i don't consider myself anything special i consider myself as common as dirt um and it's just, you know, for God's sake, I'm a West Virginia hillbilly, for God's sake. Yeah, um, but, you know, you're a very smart one. Now, this also destroyed your career. I mean, did they try to grab you and throw you in jail? I mean, they must yeah, have, this Rudolph guy must have been livid when, when this happened, right? Oh, man, <laughs> that's putting it mildly. Um, I get back to the hangar. He sees the detonation out there. And it looked like a mohab going off. It's such an explosion. And um, this is, this tells you how smart Rudolph is. Not a word. He's just looking at me. He's looking out there. He looks back at me. He's looking at my body from top of my head to my feet. And then finally he walks over and he grabs my left hand. And he rolls the palm over and he looks at the grease. He turns and looks at the hangar door hub, looks back at me, looks back out the pistol, then looks me right in the eye and says, very clever, very clever. He said, that's going to cost you the rest of your life. And then he told me how he has a cadaver there that the 17-year-old, to change the dental records match, they're going to burn the body, send it back to White Sands, who will send it to my parents, and say I died in an explosion that a mishap at White Sands, and I will be there for the rest of my entire life. And this is a guy that killed a, thousands of people at Metalwork. So these blue eyes I'm staring into is a pure sociopath. He's a Gestapo. Right. And I'm sitting there going, oh, God, I am in such trouble. But, um, well, I had some colorful metaphors for him. He hits me. He hits me so hard that my lower teeth come through my lower lip, and I hit the ground, and I'm spitting blood everywhere. And um, I have this interesting scar on my lip uh, from on the inside. But um, anyway, I hear all these guns cocking, and I'm thinking, "Oh, great! You know, everybody wants to shoot me dead, probably." So I look up. And guess where all the gun barrels are pointing? At Rudolph. Think about it. This is a German Gestapo. These are U.S. Air Force personnel. They themselves, if they're old enough, or their fathers, fought this guy. Now, this guy just smacked the living daylights out of a teenager from Ohio. How do you think these Air Force people are feeling at this moment? And I'm looking up and I'm spitting blood, and I tell Rudolph, you know what? I don't think World War II is over with. There's a guy thing went, no, it's not. So Rudolph had a real problem at that moment. And I thought, how interesting that this is developing the way it is. Um, anyway, I get drug off to a room uh, by the black suits, and um, they lock me in this room, and I sit there and wait. Um, Seemed like I was there forever, but I probably wasn't there for maybe eight hours. And it's just a room with one door and a light bulb hanging from a wire. And I'm really seriously thinking about how can I kill myself? Because the plans are burned up back home. I just blew up piss them. If I do myself in, they got absolutely no way of reconstructing nothing. So I, I got them. So I got to figure out how to take myself out. And, um, then things started changing. There's a big ruckus in the hallway. Door flies open. And I tell by the frame, the square built frame, it, and this big stogie going back and forth in the mouth. That is General Curtis LeMay standing there. And he's got this full colonel that was in the golf cart by his tie. And he's banging him from wall to wall. And um, I don't know if you know this or not, but the way things are structured with the Air Force, uh, Ellis and Area 51 come under the jurisdiction of SAC, Strategic Air Command. And who was the head of SAC? LeMay. Who put these commanding officers at these bases? LeMay. 
So that's why he's up there. He had flu. What happened was, I didn't tell you, while all this was going on, uh, Blue Beret uh, Colonel Williams escapes. He gets to a radio and calls LeMay and tells him, Rudolph took me somewhere and tells him where. So LeMay gets in his private jet, a Sabre liner. It's like a Lear, bigger than a Lear. And um, he flies straight into Area 51 to pick me up. That's how I get out of there. So he puts me. Okay, now I, I, I want, <coughs> that's great. But I want to ask you something, um, which I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Because, yes, you got your father to destroy the plans and you destroyed the rocket. But is it possible that you have, uh, that you might have been mind controlled, taken, maybe even uh, abducted at a later date and down, you know, gotten the, your information in your head downloaded? I know this sounds a little bizarre, but you know what I'm saying? In other words, you no, might have gotten away no, then I, or I, even then if it did happen how would i know i'd be mind controlled right um, no yes. i don't feel anything like that no that's why i just don't give a crap about area 51 this story or anything else goes with it because i've had a really good happy life uh in corporate america um i, re I did really well I retired when i was 50 between my portfolio, my full Navy pensions, uh, all the other stuff. I've been doing great. And, um, you know, I'm not going to burn my life up trying to figure out what did what, who was wearing, what's going to happen next. And I just don't care. Uh, it's, <laughs> okay. You know, I have a life and I went on and lived it. And uh, it's been a pretty good life. Um, it's not what I wanted. What I wanted was not to get abducted, which comes right after this part of the story. The next time I get abducted, oh, I'll right. Grant, you were put into the, you were put into the, what, the army? No. Um, they first, uh, I mean, well, we, my mate uh, flew me back to uh, Wright Patterson. Then he had his car and driver take me back to Mount Vernon, where I lived, and I was delivered back home. And he told me that he's going to burn the paper trail as best he can, mainly because he's trying to cover his own butt. That's what it is. Because all this was illegal, and it was about to have a whistle blown on him by uh, Congressman John Ashbrook, who was very much left to the Boy Scouts. And he said it was illegal what they're doing with a, a teenager, a minor, you know, running through all these operations and brain draining and all that stuff. So, he got mad and he was going to turn them all in and uh, have a Senate hearing committee, congressional hearing. And uh, that's when Rudolph started doing his thing and cut off. But um, what I wanted was I was, <laughs> that was the, I went back to high school, I'm a rising senior. That story I just told you is how I spent my summer vacation of my junior year in high school. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, and sure enough, we were asked, what did you do for the summer? <laughs> and they wanted to know what happened with me and the English teacher, and I just wrote, I worked at Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just absurd and same thing. Okay, but, anyway. but at a certain point, you got, they, they, they basically got you again, right? Yeah, what happened was LeMay said, uh, he warned me, he said, uh, you're going to go back to high school, you're going to graduate, but I'll tell you, they are not through with you. I will try to do what I can to help you, but you are. One thing that you can do, don't ever agree to build another rocket of any kind and do not work on fusion containment for most of your life. And I said, uh, okay, I can see that. So I'm in graduation now. It's June 4th, 1972. I'm in the front of the high school with all my fellow uh, friends, uh, classmates, shaking um, hands with the um, parents as they go by. I've got a scholarship. I have a scholarship to anywhere I want to go, anywhere. And um, so I thought, man, this is exactly what I want. I want either particle physics or maybe theoretical physics. 
and um, get my PhD and go into an institution of some kind and teach. I just want to teach kids uh, all the stuff that we could do. That's what I wanted. However, there was, <laughs> there was a little different plan. And I'm standing there with shaking hands with parents, and it's about 90 degrees, so hot, I'm in cap and gown. And I reach over and I grab this hand, I'm not even looking at it, but the first thing I noticed, just, I thought it was some mother, because the hand was ice cold. And I turn my head and look at him, and there's two guys standing there in black suits with mirror sunglasses. And they hand me this letter, and I step back and I open up the letter, and it says, greetings. Do you know what that means? I'm drafted. I am drafted right on the spot. It's 1972, drafted and shut down 1975. So they grab me, still in my cap and gown. We go flying across the parking lot. And um, and what's interesting is that on this biography, we have my classmates that this producer found. She found my classmates. Uh, and uh, they're all old adults now. <laughs> we all are. But they'll tell you, yeah, we wonder what happened. You just disappeared in that station wagon. You're gone. And your parents were screaming and crying, and somebody yelled, legal conscription. And I'm like, that's exactly right. What that means is that you are legally kidnapped. There's not a thing you can say about it because the draft is on. I'm a 1A, and my draft number was, I think, 16. So they had me. So off we went, and we drive for about an hour and a half to Port Columbus. We go down to the military air transport section of the airport. You see them at all airports where you see the military planes, that's Mac. So we get out and there's a jet waiting for me, a little private jet. So I'm starting to get in the head toward jet and out of the hangar comes a truck and all these Air Force people come piling out and they've all got M16s. And everybody's cocking their guns. The black suits pull out their MPK-5s. Everybody's cocking guns, pointing at each other. And there's going to be one gun battle that you're not going to believe. And I thought, God almighty, I don't believe this. So the Air Force people are claiming me. They don't want me to go where this plane's going, which is heading toward Langley, home of the CIA. So I go to Colonel Williams, who's I'll be standing there with his gun, and I just asked him, uh, asked Colonel, uh, his name is Arthur, and I said, Arthur, please let me go with these guys. Look at everybody. You know, the MPK-5 fires 35 rounds every five seconds. The M16, about the same amount. It's going to be a firefight. A lot of people are not going to go home. I said, let everybody go home their families. I'll just go home with this guy and let's just go at us with him, okay? Just let it go. Yeah, he finally did. But you got to remember, Williams really got attached to me. He thought I was just a, just a nice kid, I guess. He just liked me. He didn't want to see me going, but I, I just begged him to let it go. So I get on board and we fly away. And uh, no time at all, I'm there at Langley. And um, I'm in this, this Langley building has changed so much over the years. It's, it's just crazy how many times they've rebuilt that building. But at the time I was there in 1972, um, I was in a wing of a building where I could see the main body of the building. And this wing was set up. It looked just like a hospital. It was a hospital room with a hospital bed and all the oxygen hose and all that stuff. So I thought, I wonder what this is about. The door opens up and walks Rudolph and other guys, his friends in white coats, and they drag him to this table and they throw back the uh, cloth and there's all these needles and bottles and stuff and I'm trying to read the labels quickly on the bottles and sure enough, sodium pentothal, sodium barbitol, all the sodium families. And I thought, God, he's going to try to rip my brain apart. So I try to do fighting, there's too many of them and you're stripped naked. I know how a woman feels when examination, they put you on a cold stainless steel table. Just awful, and um, strapped down, can't do anything. And then on my left hand, I'll never forget this. I have a really good sized vein on my left hand, 
That needle went in and it felt like liquid fire coming up my arm. And when it got to my neck, to the carotid artery, that's the last thing I remember. And, uh, oh, so they yeah. did get, they actually did exactly what I said. Yeah, they did. And anyway, I remember coming around, I don't know, a day or a day and a half later. I, I didn't even open my eyes. And I could hear him talking, and there was arguments going on between Rudolph and the other people. And he said, uh, he's been under almost two days. You're not supposed to put a person under sodium barbitol, penicillin, any of that stuff for more than 30 minutes. I've been under two days. And they apparently still hadn't got what they wanted. And Rudolph they said, he's going to be a vegetable. And he said, I don't care. You know, pump it again. And they did, and I went out. So another day goes by, I wake up, and um, uh, <laughs> I'm a mess on that table. And I remember a big argument out in the hallway, people yelling stuff, and some guy came in and said, well, you're going to go to the Army, we're going to send you to Vietnam. I thought, oh, they're going to just kill me. It's good. I'm all for that. So, um, and then he said, would you work on rockets? I said, never. Uh, so, big argument out in the hallway, <laughs> guy comes back, and he says, um, how do you feel about jet engines? I went, those are defensive, I could work on that. So he goes back out, more arguments, comes back in, and says, you're going to the United States Navy. And I was with the Navy for 11 years. All right, all right, yep. So, anyway, that, um, yeah, and it's Moore's story. It was Navy that got Rudolph off. Uh, they removed Rudolph out of my life after they found I was really handy in the Navy. So the second time they grabbed me didn't cost me one day. It cost me 11 years. I never got to go to universities like I wanted to and get the PhD. However, once I got out of the Navy, um, the Admiral asked me, uh, these pile of papers, I said, yeah, what is that? And they said, it's you. I said, what are you talking about? He said, these are job offers from the aerospace companies that's worked with you for the last 11 years. They all want you. Who are you going to work for? We got a pool going. I said, really? <laughs> and I said, so I, I said, can I look through the stack? He said, they're yours. Take them with you. So I looked through them, came back, and Adam said, well, who are you going to work for? So we know who wins the pool. And I said, all of them at the same time i'm going to open my own company called intersect incorporated and i'll just become a consultant and i've worked for everybody that one smiled real big said, that i won he goes that's what i said you would do and um so for the next 35 years that's what it did and um did really well you ought to see some of the stuff i've done the, sp the spinoff division my gosh uh you really should let me give you a I have a whole program called spinoffs and I'll show you some of my work that I've done. Um, All right. Now we're gonna have to we're gonna have to close this down. This is fabulous. You did a great job. Um I'm sure everyone's been hanging in the whole time. So uh thank you so much. But yeah. we this this is like the longest interview we've done online in a live setting. <laughs> and now you sound like Art Bell. <laughs> and everything, everything hung in there, and I'm so glad for that. Um, I do want to thank you so much for doing this. It's it's just extraordinary. Uh, I, I'd like you to wrap it up and give me some parting words. Uh, let everyone know. I just want to let everyone know tomorrow at 1 p.m. I have Catherine Austin Fitz. She's going to talk about the global financial situation, and uh, so tune in back in for that. But tonight, David Adair, you are an amazing guy, and uh, this is a, a, a phenomenal story, and I sure would like to see it made into a movie. There's probably okay. there's a reason to have you back, so we'll do it. Um, and if I ever get to see you in person, it would be great to do a, an in-person interview as well. Um, so thank you. Is there any parting words you'd like to, to say to the audience? Yeah. Um uh, obviously, I'm a science guy, but I'm a, a contradiction in the area because I'm a people-powered science person. You don't get that every day. Right. Um, I just love people. I really do. Uh, all kinds of 
whatever country, it doesn't matter. You're a human being. I just really care about you people. That's, I've always, everything I've done in my entire career, I have done stuff that's made its way into the public service. You use so many things I've created, you have no idea that uh, me that did it. And that was the whole idea. I just, the only way I want to be remembered is, oh, he's so great, he's so wonderful. Said, no, that's not how I want to be remembered. All I want to be remembered as people would say, David Adair, man, he was a good and faithful servant. That's how you remembered. Fair enough. Now, I'm going to leave people with a bit of a cliffhanger here because I know that you also were part of the Stephen Greer Disclosure Project. Right. I read about that and I saw that you were kept in a room and not allowed to testify um, <laughs> and that Greer was oh, basically really? in on the cover up and that somebody told him not to allow you to testify. And I'm very glad that you're talking. You're out there talking nowadays. Um, but we're going to revisit that. I'm going to have you back on the show and we're going to talk about all of that. OK. Sure, that'd be fine. Yeah. That Good. Yeah, there was a lot of crap that went down that area. Uh, Sherry Adam Act, that whole crowd of God of mine. Um, and well, it's important to know that, you know, the cover up is still in force and uh, there are plenty of people that are, uh, you know, have tried to shut you up and uh, probably are trying again right now. And I know right. that I know that we've been shot with all kinds of weaponry, uh, electronic and otherwise, while I'm doing this interview. Uh, and I can tell you that because I'm I can feel it, and um, that's just what goes with the territory. But uh, you know, it's it's just wonderful that you're out out on the circuit talking about the truth about what happened to you. Yeah, I'm just doing it for just show y'all. You know, you can go through all this stuff. You can still have a normal life. You can still raise a family. All that kind of stuff is still possible. Uh, they haven't won everything like they want you to think, and it's not true. Um, I'm, a, I'm a walking day every example of it. Uh, I mean, for 11 years, I was with that crowd. And I worked for them, did so many projects. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you a single thing about it because I'm under a national security oath because I was an adult when they did that one to me. And, um, but too bad because some of the best stories and I've got is in that world. But um, the whole thing is I still was able to serve that's why I stayed 11 years because um, I was actually doing some really good making a difference for you guys. But I just like people. I I would always want to do something for all of you. Um, well, that's a wonderful I, thing. And obviously you're, you're quite a high level soul and, uh, and, and that's wonderful to see and to hear. Yeah. I don't want people to think, don't ever say, Oh, he's so wonderful. He's so great. He's amazing. Uh, I could care less. I don't even, I don't even, I don't care if you remember my name. Just know that this stuff has been done and you can stand up against the force and just by sheer standing, it just drives them crazy. They just can't stand it. So I'm still here. I'm not dead. I haven't been threatened, of course. I have been visited. Uh, but that was by former bosses and stuff. Uh, they advised me certain things to do, and I've always been a good little sailor, and I comply, and that's why I'm still here. <laughs> All right. So. Well, fair enough. Uh, listen, I, I want to thank you again. I'm going to let you go. I do want to have you back on the show. Um, you know, it, it's been fabulous, and I, I think everyone will agree. So um, everyone, thanks for listening. And, and I want to say good night to everyone. Uh, good night, David. And thank you again for coming on the show. I, I don't know what other people think, but I, I think very highly of you. I appreciate that. And um, I just hope you all feel a little bit better about things. It's not all that gloom and doom out there, y'all. Um, just don't let them overwhelm you. It's just I lived a happy, normal life despite all the stuff that went on with me. And I had a terrific wife who died 14 months ago, but I had 20 fabulous years with her. And uh, since she's not here, is why I'm talking to y'all again, because otherwise I would have stayed right next to her and not moved anywhere. All right.
Okay, thank you so much and uh, take care. Um, be safe, okay? And, right. and, we'll, and we'll, we'll be back in touch with you, okay? Okay, appreciate take, it. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Uh, quite an extraordinary man, no doubt about it. So um, we will have him back to get some more of his story in the near future. And thanks for listening and for supporting Camelot. And please do tune in to see Catherine Austin Fitz uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, of course, that will go on my YouTube channel as well. So uh, take care and have a great night. Good night. Bye.